put in there. We got Andrew here in Austin. Hi. Uh, did you read Matthew five twenty seven and twenty eight? Sure, I've read the whole Bible several times. Okay. Do you know what it says there? Is that the passage about uh, adultery, where it's not doesn't just have to be physical adultery? If you look at another woman, another man's wife with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. Exactly. It says, "Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart." Sure. Um, that's that's. Uh, that how do you not think that that's a good thing for people to have limits? You, you think on, that's you think that's a good it's called, thing. It's called mind control. You're trying to determine what I think and what I don't think. That's but one that, of the stupidest if, things I could imagine. How can you control or even pretend to control what somebody thinks? And you don't think Jesus looked on a woman without lust or any of his that's disciples? That's what Jesus said. That. That is Jesus, what Jesus said right there. Well, yeah. first, first, first of all, we'll, we'll set aside how you think you know that this is what Jesus said. Second of side, we'll, we'll set aside whether or not it matters whether Jesus said it. I don't care who said it. If it's wrong, it's wrong. And so if somebody says, now I'll, I will say, if a man looks on a woman lustfully, he's committed adultery in his heart, is absolutely wrong. Because first of all, he's not necessarily married, and adultery is uh, specifically a, a lustful or sexual action that extends beyond the bounds of marriage. So as a single person, looking on a woman lustfully isn't adultery. And by the way, I put it to you that almost nobody on the planet outside of arranged marriages would have ever gotten married or had sex if they hadn't looked at someone of the opposite sex lustfully. And finally, why is it a man looking at a woman lustfully? Why isn't it a woman looking at a man lustfully? lustfully or a man looking at a man or a woman looking at a woman? This when, is a misogynist. Hang, hang on, hang on. If you see a beautiful Andrew, woman, do Andrew, you just go rape her right Andrew, away? Andrew, I'm going to let you, just let me finish the thought. It's a misogynistic bit of language that is patently absurd. It denies something that is trivial about human nature and the way things actually work and tries to compound it as sin okay I could care less if somebody wants to call it sin now go ahead well, don't you think it's important to have limits on your sexual sexual desires otherwise everyone would just be raping everyone really you think people would just run around raping people well do you just do you just rape someone I haven't raped anybody in the last uh, 50 some years. Yeah, I've never, I've never raped anybody, nor have I had the inclination I've to. I've been an atheist for 20 years. So I, it's just amazing. So you know that that's, you do. How, how, you do, do you, how do you get from, it's probably a good thing if people don't run around raping each other, to therefore this statement about lustful thoughts is necessarily morally correct. Please make the connection between those two. How do you get from, we should have some limits to what we can do, to, we need to we need to have thought crime legislation. How well, do you how do you get there? What limits do atheists have? Well, what culture? Tell me one culture that doesn't have limits. And it's I mean, there's all every culture on the face of the earth has limits, and it's they're not Christian cultures. Chinese culture has got limits. Japanese, the most secular country in the world is Japan. They have the lowest rape rate. Denmark, but, Sweden, but, they it, very unreligious places, religion, and they don't have religion. any rape problem. We have much more rape in the United States and by than the they way, ever do in Denmark or Sweden. Religion doesn't seem to, to, to be any kind of deterrent to rape. Are you implying that all rapists are non-Christians or non-religious? What about the, the priests who are raping little boys and little girls? Well, I just where, got do back get, from, where do you get your limits from? I get my limits from a rational consideration of the consequences of my actions. That's how I determine what's moral. I get it from a foundation that says my actions have an effect on those people around me and theirs have an effect on me. And that if we're going to live cooperatively and share space, we have to recognize that impact. And my freedom to swing my arm ends at their nose. And that I have no right to impose my will over somebody else's will in that, in that type of scenario. That's where I get them from. It's from an what, understanding. What's the punishment if I get you do them, that then? I get them You're just going to die. I, Andrew, I get them from an understanding of reality, not an assertion of authority. Now, what was the question? Well, if you just do all that, let's just say you go out uh, with a gun and you just rape a bunch of people, then you just shoot what? yourself. What's going to be the punishment for you? If, if I go out and rape a bunch of people and shoot myself, what's going to be the punishment for me? Uh, I'll be dead? That's a, yeah. I'll be dead. But and and why? It's, it's do you, not do you have, uh, going to hurt. The bullet's going to go through your head in about a second. There isn't going to be any pain. That's correct. And, and I'll be dead. Okay. So let's let's flip the script here. Let's say somebody goes around and rapes and murders somebody, and then 
after they're done, they get saved. What's the punishment for them? Oh, yeah. The punishment is hell. No, no, they no, got no, saved. They got saved. Also, are you they... saying that a rapist can't be saved? Uh, See, this is the problem. This is the problem with Christian religion. It establishes unrealistic and irrational and immoral criteria by which to live. And then it creates a loophole so that you don't ever have to be responsible for those actions. Then, then, okay, Christ, religion... No, Andrew, shut up till I'm done. Christianity is not a moral system. It is an immoral system because it specifically says that there aren't necessarily consequences that you're going to have to pay because of a loophole. And what is the loophole? It has nothing to do with how good you are or how morally you act or anything else. It has to do with whether or not you're willing to be a sycophant to an idea. And if you are, then there is now an exception for which you no longer have to suffer a penalty for this. So the idea that secular morality offers no guarantee that people will ever pay for their their crimes and their, their atrocities is not an argument against secular morality because that is a tenet of Christianity. It is the foundation. Your, the idea that, that the Christian God is just is directly contradicted by the idea that the Christian God is merciful. Perfect justice and perfect in any mercy are, in, are necessarily directly in contradiction because mercy is a suspension of justice. So do not pretend that your religion is moral and just and then try to attack my position, which is based on reality, because somebody might rape people, shoot themselves ahead, and then not get punished. That's asinine. If, if religion is such a bad thing, how come you think, like, I don't know how many, like, how many atheists are there in the United States? How come everyone isn't just an atheist then? Because not everybody is aware of how bad and untrue religion is. Which is one of the reasons you, why we're doing You think you're some kind of genius or something? That like Actually, you yeah, but what, why is that relevant? Like, <laughs> everyone else is too dumb to figure it out. No, it's not a matter of too dumb. You see, I was a Christian for 25 well, plus years. Well, let me I ask was, you a question. Why, why are you taught calling in as a Christian? Why didn't you call in as a Muslim, a Buddhist, or a Hindu? Because my, my parents raised me as a Christian. So you didn't have a choice, did you? When did you no. choose to be a Christian? Oh, it's just a tradition. Your parents teach you ah. whatever religion they do. Uh, so if you were born over black, so, so uh, if you were born a Muslim, you'd be a Muslim. Yeah. So if you were born born a Muslim, so it has nothing to do with truth. Then it's just right. the way you were raised. See, because on this show we actually care about whether or not things are true, and my genius status is completely irrelevant because I was a Christian for twenty five plus years. I did not get smarter. When I became an atheist, what happened was I gained more information, I became more knowledgeable about subjects, and I decided to actually care whether or not my beliefs were true. You don't seem to care whether or not your beliefs are true, you just like them. Because you were born here. Well, if I think it's good, I think you're going to have more happiness in your life if you have limits to tell you what you can do. or uh, what, like, How is that relevant to the truth of your religion? I, I've it's already not said. all true. I know. I was talking to people on the ch on the chat here, and they said, "Well, they're, like read the Old Testament. There's all this genocide and stuff." And I was just saying, "Well, just you don't have to read the whole thing because you just read, for example, what Jesus said." Okay. You don't. So, so are you saying? I, I tell you what, we already talked about this earlier. Um, not everything that Jesus said is true or good or smart or wise either. So why would you care at all what any of them have to say? You're not concerned about truth. You've already just said you can pick and choose and toss aside the things you don't like. So you're inventing your own version of Christianity. So why not just chuck it aside and go ahead and invent your own secular moral system? You keep talking about how we don't have limits. I have plenty of limits. And we live in a society that has plenty of limits. As Daryl's already pointed out, most societies have limits. You keep going to this slippery slope thing of, well, if there is no you know, Ten Commandments or Jesus or whatever, then you've got no limits. You'll just run around raping and killing people. Well, that's already demonstrably false. And there have been multiple studies that, that actually investigate the correlation between the religiosity of a society and its societal health. And there is always a strong negative correlation. The more atheists the society, the better they score on societal health factors from everything from teenage pregnancy rates to STDs to happiness to wealth to, to murder, uh, murder rape. rape to um, health care. Now, go out and do some actual research that contradicts this, and then you might have a case for your assertion that I think you'll live a better life if you're... No, you won't. 
There's no, there's no, demo, there's no evidence to demonstrate this. This is wishful thinking. Just as you, not only have you gone and said, well, I'll pick and choose what I want, you've done it in a way that where you're just trying to support your own wishful thinking. And until you actually come up with evidence, and until you demonstrate that you care about the truth, we don't really need to waste any more time on it. And I guess we won't. Mike in Austin, you're on Hello, the air. Hello, I am from the Austin Stone. I'm sure you know the church. Okay. And um, I welcome you to join it. Uh, we've got a great church, and uh, we're pretty much by the book. And uh, I've, helped, I've helped many lost souls uh, find their way, uh, so to speak. Yeah. We're not lost. Don't have a soul. Wait, is this just a call <laughs> to advertise your church? Well, uh, I, I just wanted to start off by um, welcoming you to join, if you want. Well, it thank you. It sounds like you obviously don't belong to one now, do you? No, you're right. You're I right. Don't. We don't. But thank and, you for the but, invite. But you did one time, didn't you? I did. Yes, I did as well. So you didn't uh, feel any warmth when you sang the hymns or listened to sermons or anything? Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah, the, but that has nothing to do with whether um, it, 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 I the came theology to the is true or not. Feelings are not God. Yeah. So why exactly did you quit? Well, I quit because I did a lot of research into how the Bible came to exist and also into church history, how the church came to exist. And when I realized that, in my view, I couldn't find anything to substantiate that there was a hand of God involved, um, I began to question the authority of the church and of the Bible. And at that point, I stopped being a Christian, but I maintained theism for about another 10 years while I searched to try to find out then if, if the Bible is, not, is, is a man-made book and if the church... Um, founded yeah, on, you know, Jesus out. is based on that Bible and it's a man-made institution, then what really is God and, and what would God want me to do? And so I, I aimed my search more toward, you know, just putting my life in the hands of whatever God was, that he would show me what, what was required, what I needed to do, just lead the way and I will follow, I'm searching. That went on for about 10 years until I came to the conclusion that um, if God is everything, uh, pretty much that's pantheism, so I thought I was a pantheist for about a week. I guess I was a pantheist for about a week. And then I said, this is kind of ridiculous. It's the universe. And so we have a name for it. And God and matter are not the same thing. Material existence is material existence. And if that's what I'm calling God, then I might as well just say I'm an atheist. Well, it, se it seems to me that uh, you can be a non-believer, but it's another step if you want to make a show and say you're an atheist and uh, start to say these bitter things. Uh, well, why? What if I said that's bitter? Yeah, why do you think we're bitter? Well, I mean, you, just the general tone I get from you is that you're actually mad or angry uh, with God. Gosh, uh, we just oh had that my goodness! <laughs> is this a joke? Are you a Poe? Is this a Poe or are you for real? Are you are you calling just to pull our legs or is this a, a serious call? This is a serious call. Uh, okay, so so now wait a second. And, Do uh, you understand they, that an atheist does not believe a God exists? Do you understand that? Do you understand are, that an yes. atheist does not believe a God exists? Yes, well, of course. Okay, I, then, I then do you understand? Stupid, yeah. Okay, then do, I'm not accusing you of being stupid. I just want to make sure we're clear on our definitions. If you understand I don't believe a God exists, how does the statement, I'm angry at God, make any sense at all? Well, angry, angry about religion, then. About, Thank about you. About this so-called institution, you call it. It is an institution. I mean, even if, it, yeah. even if you believe God produced it, it's still an institution. Right? I mean, it's, it's institutionalized. Well, for you sure. said yourself that you felt some warmth when you went to church, that it just wasn't for you, but uh, why, why do you have to make a show and say these things then? Well, Did you not hear the example of the homeopathic uh, remedy? Did you hear what I just talked about? If not, I'm happy to repeat it. I mean, really, if you were on the phone and you were on hold and you weren't really hearing it, that's fine. I'm happy to give you the example again. But the point is, I said that there would even be people that don't believe in homeopathy that would write to you and say, well, some people are helped just because they feel better because of a, a placebo effect. So why are you bitching about homeopathy? But the fact is there's a lot of people harmed by homeopathy. Well, and I can't... Who does the church harm? Who does the church harm? Does, are you kidding? We have, first of all, Christians in Nigeria who are killing their own children because God said to not suffer witches to live, and they believe their children are witches. We have Christians in Uganda who are passing laws to, they wanted to execute homosexuals as a crime, but now they've made it life in prison. 
We have Christians in Africa that are missioning and telling people in AIDS-ridden nations not to wear condoms. We have Christians here in Austin, Texas, who don't think that a woman should have a right to choose, that are down on women's rights. We have Christians across the U.S. who are trying to trample the rights of, of gays, who are trying well, to, to keep look, them I find from... It, I personally find it a bit insulting for you to say that my church is bad people. They're good people at my church. We didn't say, when did we I didn't, say we didn't that say, your church is bad people? You asked me to give you examples of the harm that religion causes, and I just listed some. You, you asked think, me to. You don't to. think there are atheists who do bad things? I could tell you about them. How you would that make didn't, you feel? Wait a minute. Well, you, well, no. you didn't ask me to provide examples of that. You asked me specifically for examples of the harm that religion causes. You asked for that, and I provided it. How is that offensive to you? Well, I didn't do anything wrong to anyone. In fact, I think I'm a pretty no, good No one said you did. me to give you examples of wrong you've done. You asked me to give examples of harm that the church has caused, that religion has caused, and I provided those examples. How is that a problem? Well... Why should that offend you? Why did you even ask for examples if, if getting those examples was going to upset you? All right, then. Well, I, I just... Why, why don't you just have someone like Dr. Craig on your show? Why do you always beat up on, on random people who call in? Why did you have some actual... No, 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 no. Who am I beating no, up? Stop. We're not beating up anybody. I'm answering your question. And, and listen, there, there are however many um, religious shows on public access television and network television. And there's, there's this one atheist show here in Austin, Texas. Why should we give um, airtime to a professional apologist? Because they're actually educated on the subject so you so, might actually have a challenge i think please. you guys are too so, scared so wait to have a minute. the serious guys on none of none of us are professional atheists whatever that would entail <laughs> right. okay we're inviting people to call and tell us what they believe why they believe it and why we should believe it too right but the other point i, I want to just reiterate what jen said earlier because i want to make sure you heard this there are hours and hours and hours of TV and radio and indoctrinal institutions around the globe going nonstop promoting religious indoctrination and religious belief. And I really think it's ridiculous to get upset at a one-hour atheist amateur program that's put out weekly by an educational foundation here in Austin that's really just about putting out information on atheism. You think that one hour dedicated by a bunch of amateur atheists yeah, producers and, and cast and crew is is really that that intimidating to you it's not intimidating it certainly bothers people it, it my, certainly bothers you church. it bothers you yeah but i mean look at all the airtime you've got i mean for one billboard we put up in austin how many religious billboards do i pass well, no every wonder, day no wonder we have more shows we're about 99 percent of the country really no, you're That's, not. There's, no, I think, no, no, what is no. it, like 80% religious, and um, yeah. not all of that is Christian, but it wouldn't matter. Yeah. I don't, it I don't doesn't care. Matter. The point is, you have all the airtime, all the radio time, and we have a one-hour prayer. You know what it reminds me of? There's a, there's a parable, actually, in your Bible that, that reminds me of this. It's, it's the one where they give the example of the guy who has, like, 100 sheep, and his neighbor has, like, one little pet sheep, and the guy with the 100 sheep goes and steals his neighbor's sheep and slaughters it. And it's like, wow, you couldn't really deal with, like, the guy having one sheep? That was, like, freaked you out, that your neighbor had one sheep, was, even though you had 100. And it's like, that's kind of what you're doing. You've got, like, all the, all the air time, all the TV time, all the money, all the resources. All the, I mean, you've got people handing you 10% of the tithe. I mean, you, you've just got them coming in throwing their money at you. And yet, this one-hour show, that's, we have no budget. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> nothing. And, and we should have Christians on to, to promote Christianity, really. Does that seem reasonable to you, honestly? If you want my honest opinion, I think you guys are scared to talk to, to, oh. talk to serious, serious people about this. You'd are you serious? You'd beat up on, on some clueless guys and then... They call like us, like the callers, the right? Are the clueless ones. No, no we, we invite people to call and defend their beliefs. Anybody can call us. And, and anybody can call us. We're on the show every Sunday. We let so, you call. I mean, it, feel free to, and we're, of, we're letting you talk about whatever you want. Yeah, any of these professional apologists are welcome to call at any time. Well, Consider I, an invitation. I, just, I, I just want to say that I think a lot of the things you guys say are wrong. Well, so, uh, so I would expect that from the and I would just, For uh, example. For, pardon me? For example. Well, th uh, that... Uh, that there's no God, I guess, would be the start. If you're an atheist, then right off okay. the bat, 
um, we've got a bit of a problem. Um, well, yeah, well, well, but that's an easy problem to resolve because all it takes is a demonstration of a justification for your belief. Uh, I, you use really big words when you okay. talk. I'm sorry. It sounds a little... Okay. I just want you to demonstrate to me that your belief in the existence of a God is justified. Well, what, why do I believe in God? Well, there's evidence for God everywhere you look. Like I mean, Chaz? Just, just on the news lately... Um, we had a, a national tragedy. Uh, uh, someone got shot through the brain, That's and they horrible. survived that. And, and wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. what? They our, got shot, our, and, and they... Representative uh, Gifford right, got shot right, through the brain. Right. The doctor said it was a miracle she even lived. Um, she, got, she got shot through so the you brain, don't, you and don't she think... is still alive, and she looks like she will actually uh, get back to normal. What about the nine-year-old who died? Yeah. Well, uh, you just look on the news, and the president said she's up in heaven, and you want to tell us, you want to uh, jump in rain puddles, he said, and you want to tell people that it just lights out when you, when so you die. So the president decides who's in heaven? Yeah. He said she's jumping in rain puddles up there. Did he see her? I mean, how does he know this? Well... You want to tell us that it's just game over when you're dying? No, you, I'm just asking how you We're know how this. We're asking how you know this. What is the justification this? for claiming she's in heaven? And, and even if she is in heaven, is that a justification for someone shooting a little girl? Is that part of the miracle? Was that a nine-year-old got killed? I, it, it's a miracle that, that Representative Gifford survived. Right. Uh, imagine you got shot in the head. So Do you the think you'd have a good plan, chance to live? Right. The plan was about killing yeah. several people so that God could show his beneficence in, in making somebody go through rehab after getting brain damaged from a bullet through the brain, that's your miracle. You don't think that's a miracle? If I think it's an extreme tragedy and that it's fortunate that not everybody was killed. But I don't think it's a miracle that somebody survived and is now having to go through rehab and she can barely, I don't even know if she can speak yet. Yeah, I mean, this is somebody's know, brain damage. She's even alive. <laughs> she's brain damage, and people are dead. And that's exactly what I would expect to happen at an event where somebody shoots into a crowd. I don't consider several people shot dead and one person brain damaged to be proof of God's miraculous powers. Let me ask you something. What, how do you define a miracle? What's your definition of a miracle? A miracle is how the way God shows us is no, no, real. No, no. It's something that could never happen without God. So, so people could never, never people God. never survive a getting shot, shot in the head without God. Without God, she'd be dead, just like most people who get shot through the head with a so bullet most in their people. brain. Most so, but you admit so that how there's many some people that get shot through the head that don't die? It's pretty rare. Right, but it happens. Right, it, ten percent. That's of people. why we call it a miracle. A miracle. Okay. Is so a miracle rare is thing. a rare event. It's not something that that can't happen. It's something that could happen, but statistically would be rare. And in this case, it happens ten percent of the time. So anything that's a, that happens that's against the odds, which we would assume that in in the universe some th some rare things will happen. Every time a rare event happens, you just say God did it. Is that what we're calling a miracle now? Well, I wouldn't say it's a miracle if you win the lottery, but I would say why it's a miracle. Why not? Why not? It's a rare event. It's, in, in fact, it's How, what it's, is the statistical odds that determine a miracle? Like, at what point is it statistically become a miracle versus a rare event? I don't think you can just, uh, it's, you can't do science on it. That's because it's nothing to do with science. It's, so we don't really know at what point rare becomes miraculous versus just rare. Well, this isn't something you study in university. I mean, this is... Right, but you're saying that you recognize miracles, and I'm asking you what they are, and you're saying they're rare events. And I said, well, there's some rare events, like winning the lottery, and you said, but that's not a miracle. So I'm saying, yeah. when do we hit the point when a rare event is then determined to be a miracle? I think you guys... I, I, you guys are playing dumb with me. I think you know exactly what I mean when I say no, a miracle. No, we don't. I, I don't know what you mean. No, I want to I'm know. asking you, how do you know a, it was, how do you differentiate the rare medical survival event from a miracle? I, you mean if someone survives cancer? Right. Uh, I guess that's a miracle if they but, survive a deadly disease. But do you, disease. do you believe that there is such a thing as natural remissions that can occur? Like, for example, if you have rats in a lab and some of those rats have cancer and they have a natural remission and, and survive, that, I mean, are you thinking God is saving those rats or do you think that there's sometimes a natural remission?
Oh, I, I understand the question now. Right. Um, it's not always a miracle. First of all, God, I don't okay. think God does miracles for rats. I think it's just for humans. Right, and I, I didn't think, think you did. I just wanted, yeah, okay. I just wanted to make it clear. I mean, I didn't think that you did think God was doing miracles for rats, but I was trying to make you understand my question better. So my question is, when you see somebody survive cancer, how do you tell the difference between a natural remission, like what we would see in a rat, which we would assume would also occur in humans, versus God fixed the person? Well, obviously... It's just a question of what you believe. I mean, no, it's not. The it's a question the of what you're claiming. You, um, if God did it, or if it was natural. Uh, so the God, so the doctor can't tell if it's a natural remission or a miracle. But then, how can you tell? Well, it's just I believe that when these things happen, it's God's work that He does. Except that sometimes you think it's just a rare event. It's just a really good thing that happens. That's you didn't think was going to happen, and then it happens, and you say it's a miracle. And like that, winning the God, lottery. God loves you, and that's how he shows you he loves you, is uh, he protects you. How again. do you differentiate between a rare event that you don't think is miraculous and a miraculous rare event? I guess you can't really. It depends on different people. You might ask different people. They might say it's a miracle. Some people might say it's well, never a miracle. I know they Maybe say they it. Just one okay. thing in their life is a miracle. Right. Some people might say, right. like, every day there's a miracle. I know that people say this because I talk to them all the time. What I'm asking is, where's their justification when they say it's a miracle when they're also acknowledging that sometimes rare, fortunate things do just simply occur? So when they're saying, I've determined it's a miracle, I guess I'm asking... Where's their justification when they're telling me this is a well, miracle? Well, maybe there is no real justification. There. That's my point. There you go. But that's not necessarily a problem. It is a problem. It is a problem. If you want me to believe... It's a problem if you care whether or not the things you believe are true. If you don't care if they're true, then justification for them doesn't matter. If you care if they're true, then whether or not they're reasonable beliefs to hold and there is justification for holding them becomes important. Well, I mean... <laughs> I just think it doesn't even matter. I think this is, I don't even think it matters if it's true, if it makes you Ooh, well, feel good and do good things. Okay. Uh, well, in that case, uh, in that case, then the dialogue is kind of over. And I don't mean yeah. that in any kind of an offensive way, but honestly, when the person on the phone tells us they don't care if their beliefs are true or not, they just simply hold them and they don't, can't justify them and they don't care, then I don't really see a point in a dialogue because you're saying that even if we could demonstrate you're wrong, you don't care you're still going to believe it or you're still going to say it's okay to hold the belief. And so to you, whether or not beliefs are true is unimportant. Well, maybe we don't have a justification for miracles. That doesn't mean we don't have a good church and we, we're not good people. I don't, uh, I, and I don't doubt we, that you're a decent person. I mean, if you were my neighbor, I would probably be fine with that. I don't think that you're, you know, killing babies in the basement. I, I find all this stuff pretty philosophical, if you ask me. I don't think it has much to do with uh, whether religion is good or bad. I mean... Well, no, I mean, relig whether religion is good or bad has to do strictly with what it does. And what I see is that there are, there are some benefits to religion, such as it, it, su it, it supplies like a good support structure. For example, you're saying you've got this good community of people that, that are Yeah, like church. some people, they said the Bible helped them through like a time, like a suicide. They thought they were going to commit suicide, and the Bible okay. helped them. Well, that's, well, that's not the yeah, same. Th there's a different issue there, because I sometimes wonder if Christianity specifically doesn't kind of rob us of our self-esteem by telling us that we're inherently depraved and then give us back, you know, that sort of, if you grovel, then you're acceptable to God, and that makes you worthy of something. But that's a whole different issue. Because right now, what I'm trying to say is that I agree with you that there are certain things, like the social structure of your church is probably very supportive, and it's a positive social influence on the people that attend there. I agree with you. I agree with that, too. <laughs> right. Okay. But I also understand that there is a great deal of pain going on around the globe for religious reasons because of the same doctrines that are coming out of the same book because people read that book and they read a lot of different things. And for every Christian that I've ever met who says this is what really my religion is about, I've met other Christians who say that Christian's not a real Christian and this is what my religion is about. And so I have to look at Christians and say what does each person believe and what are they doing here? And yes, there are some good people who are Christians. And there are some evil, evil people also who are Christians. And it's the Christianity 
that seems to motivate some of these evil things. And before you react, let me just say, I don't think that people in Nigeria would be murdering their children as witches if somebody didn't tell them God wanted them to kill witches and convince them that their child was a witch. I think that is a superstitious belief that they were convinced of that is causing those deaths that would so, not be happening if they had a real world perspective that says witches are not real. Well, I mean, my church doesn't. I understand. Uh, You're not uh, killing children. I get it. Your church is not doing that. You're a happy group of people that has a community going on, and it makes you happy. The problem is, this is a belief that proselytizes all around the globe, and different people interpret it in different ways, and it causes a lot of harm. Most of the harm that comes from the religious teaching seems to be connected to the supernatural and superstitious parts and claims about it. The parts that are good are the very real things that we agree are good, that are like you're talking about, the social structure. We get together, we sing songs, we feel happy, we like each other, we rely on each other. If someone needs help, we come together and help them. All of that is community, it's good. It would be good whether you were a, a social group or a church. It would still be good either way for you people to come together and be a good community group of people. I would support that. What I have problems with is when you start teaching people things that are superstitious and supernatural that a lot of uneducated people get a hold of, don't know how to interpret, and start hurting each other. Or you get some people who are educated who hurt people, who are like voting and saying, you know, gay people need to be not treated like other people. They need to be treated less than other people. Or they need to be, you know, that women shouldn't have the same rights as, as men. Or that, I mean, when you start getting things like that, I mean, these are people that did get a regular education who don't know how to read this and not make it hurt people. So what I'm saying is maybe if we took the good parts of it that you're saying are the good things, like the You mean we need to make a, a, a new New Testament with, with no, uh, with no uh, supernatural thing? I'm, I'm saying maybe we can just take the good community aspects of what you do as a church and hold on to those things and maybe weed out some of the stuff that you're saying we can't really demonstrate and maybe it's not true but we don't really care let's is, is, let's is care. that what your organization does you like you just it's sort of like you help people but you have no bible you have no we are a community group we're pretty small yeah. i mean i'm going to admit we probably don't have the the resource power that your church has behind it for sure but we do our part we have like an adopt a street cleanup and we have a blood drive and we, so we do do community yeah. efforts and we try we're not a humanist group now i will tell you that there are secular organizations that are Are you guys do you guys belong to other organizations? Yeah, there's yeah. like a the coalition of reason which is like a national arm that we just right. uh, like had a partnership with i guess. Yeah, we have a local yeah. coalition. So um, i mean there's the but there's coalition. a little bit of networking but the thing is what you're describing would be like a humanist group or even like a Unitarian Universalist church might be more along those lines right. of like a group of people who are really getting together to do like a, a sort of almost secular I hate I don't know I don't know if it's I don't know if it's correct or incorrect to call it a secular religion, but it's almost like a, a secular sort of we believe in helping humanity. Yeah. And so there's a there's a group called humanists that would be secular generally so you don't have to be secular to be humanist, don't get me wrong. But right. They, their goal is just sort of like, let's promote the welfare of, of the human good. And well, I think I thought, that's I fine. I thought all you guys did was just uh, go out and, and, and uh, do protests and say uh, you don't like religion. I thought, I didn't know well, you actually did. We, we also do protests, but I th yeah. honestly, I mean, there's some things that we protest that there are church groups that would protest as exactly. well and that do protest as well. For example, the, um, was it the, separate, the People United or Americans United for Americans Separation United, of Church yeah. and State is headed by a minister yeah. who, who believes that the government should stay out of religion. And so he wants to see that separate because he believes that his religion is better served by not having the government involved in what they're preaching and what they're doing. And so that is a, an area where we are aligned with certain churches who believe that it's best that the government stays out of religious belief. And so we, and we believe, of course, from the secular side that it's good that religion stays out of the, the government. And so we see it both as a mutually beneficial thing, agreeing that religion benefits when government doesn't run it, and government does well when it, it handles the secular concerns and lets religion handle you know, the, the, the people that are religious and let them figure out what they want to do with their own yeah. religion. That's up to them. It's a personal, private decisions for them to make and not something, not something the government should be oh. dictating. Well, thank, thanks so much, guys. I, I think I have good news for you because I don't think most people, uh, I think most, 
I don't think most people actually like the bad parts of the Bible, so they wouldn't. They would like to get rid of that too, maybe. But I hope it you're would right. be hard for yeah. them. I hope you're right, and I thank you for your call. Yes. Okay. Well, that was interesting. It was a good call. Yeah, I appreciate the call. Austin, Mark in Austin, who is local. We'll start with local fellow. Good. Hello. There you are. Mark. Hi. I, I have a lot of experience with theology and the academic side of Christianity, so okay. I thought I would call in and have a polite debate with you. That's fantastic. Uh, where uh, you, uh, I'm seeing on the board here, are uh, calling on behalf of your church? A lot of the youth at my church have been watching your program. <laughs> um, thank Hi. you. And while myself and the parents find it amusing, we are worried that the youth are being tricked and deceived by your program. Oh, oh dear. Well, um, we don't. I think you're onto us. Uh oh. Yeah. No, uh, seriously. Also, my I mean, congregation is watching, so please be polite. Last time okay. someone from our congregation called, your host, Jeff, was uh, wild. Je Jeff can be a bit of a firebrand, I'll admit that. Uh, you're going to need to. We're Watch feeding it. back. We've got some feedback. Yeah, you're, you're gonna, if you're watching okay. on your television while you're We've talking to us. We've been having some problems with uh, with studio stuff for the last few weeks. Okay. So, um, because also, be if you're watching if you're watching the program and you have your television turned up, sometimes that will feed back into the phone also. Okay. So you don't want to do that. Well, um, anyway, you know, well the the rule of this program is that you get what you give. So you know, um, we're all about having polite discussions. As long, you know, but it works both ways. So. And so, uh, have you mentioned what what your church is? Mark, Pardon, I can't hear you very well. Oh, okay. Uh, have you mentioned what your church is? Would you like to plug them? My church is the Austin Stone. Um, okay. And, um, Hi, Austin Stone. Go on. We are a New Testament church. Okay. Okay, so well, what's your question? Or what would you like to talk about well, today? Well, my question um, is, first of all, um, is it true that... On your show, um, you made um, a comparison between God and Bigfoot. Oh, very likely, yes. Yeah, we quite possibly have done that, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, <laughs> okay uh, first of all, um, it is true there is no Bigfoot um, because there simply are no transitional forms. Uh, there, there is a, a $10,000 <laughs> <Yeah, that's like laughs> cash prize for anyone who presents a transitional form to um, yeah, but to, I, to I Ray, think Ray Comfort. I, I think you're, <laughs> Ray oh, Comfort. Oh, you're you're one of this batch. All right. Right. Okay. Um, I think you'll find that the reason that we brought up Bigfoot is because people frequently ask us, why don't you believe in God, and uh, and can you prove that there's no God, and the kind of response that we usually uh, that we usually throw out there is it doesn't have to be bigfoot it could be leprechauns or fairies or unicorns but the question is mm -hmm. do you believe you don't believe in bigfoot but can you prove that there's no bigfoot well i i think you are correct that bigfoot is not real however god is real right but you can't prove that bigfoot doesn't exist that is probably the point that somebody was trying to make by bringing it up earlier Yes. Um. So, okay. what we're saying, I, I'm sorry, uh, I should draw these lines a little better. When we say, when we say that uh, we're atheists and we don't believe that God exists, the point that we're making is that in order to demonstrate that something like a God exists, um, the burden of proof rests on the person making the claim. So if you wanted to make me believe that Bigfoot exists, you would have to find, you would have to first present some pretty convincing reasons why you would believe in Bigfoot. Now, you don't believe in Bigfoot. Um, you do believe in this uh, omnipotent presence in the universe. And all we like to say is basically, you know, how do you know what kind of evidence would you have about that? Now, this is where you start to lose your credibility with people okay. who have watched uh, the program before. Well, I'm uh, sorry because, about that. Because Matt Slick already did a proof for God. Yeah, and we you just... You might remember it from the episode he called in 
and embarrassed Matt Dillahunty, your organization's president. <laughs> that's, oh, that's really funny. not how we saw it. Actually, yeah. what, what's interesting is that after that episode happened, he went back and changed the, uh, the web page where he was making that argument because uh, Matt demonstrated that uh, his argument didn't work. Right, right. Well, because the point is, is that you can take, you could take Matt's. Mm -hmm. I wasn't on that actual program, but we watched it. Uh, you I could mean, take Matt Slick. Matt, yeah, you could take yeah. Matt Slick's entire. Uh, we've, we're familiar with the transitional argument for God, and, we have, and there was that whole uh, program about it. The problem with it, as Matt Slick presents it on the CARM website, is that you can take his entire argument word for word, right? Every single one of his points, as it's outlined, and. Even if you were to grant him, for the sake of argument, every one of his premises, although um, on that program we pointed out where some of the, uh, Matt pointed out, Matt Dillahunty pointed out where some of the premises were flawed, even if you took his entire argument as written and said, all right, I'll grant you this, I'll grant you this, I'll grant you this, I'll grant you this, you get right down to his conclusion at the very bottom where he says, uh, and we call this creative force or whatever, we call this thing God, right? When you get to his conclusion, you can take his entire argument, you can replace the word God in the conclusion with Zeus, with the flying spaghetti monster, with any mythical being that you care to dream up. And the argument works just as well. All right? you, can, you, can, you can take his entire argument as worded and come up with the same conclusion, and we call this being the invisible magic space pixie. And the, and the argument works just as well. So that essentially is why the argument failed. And what, well, Matt, Sli I, I, and what Matt Slick did was... I, I think that Matt Slick's point was that um, everything is physical or conceptual. So, 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 so absolutely... But do you agree with me that you can... not physical. But do so you agree with me that you can do that with his argument? And that means they're concept in God's mind. Well, how, so, do, you, how do you distinguish uh, God's... Well, first off, how do you distinguish God's mind as a thing that actually exists? Well, that is how you... How you prove that um, God's mind exists? But I just, but as then I just the, explained the to you, the evidence from the Bible will uh, prove that the Christian God exists. But the, the, what I what I just what I just brought up, right, was that the transcendental argument for God, as Matt Slick had written on the Karm website, in its exact wording, you can re replace the word God with the name of any mythological being that you choose, and the argument works just the same. And you didn't disagree with me when I said that. So do, shall I take that as agreement that the argument works just well as the transcendental argument for anything? It proves that there's a mind. Well, well, how does it, okay, well, how does it even on. prove... Can I, can I change well, ta track? I'm right. sorry. No, I'm just... Well, I, I just want to say, but you agree then that the argument can be used just as well to prove... Prove... Any, any mythological being as well as God. Am I right or am I wrong when I suggest that? It proves there is some God, then the Bible proves the God is the Christian God. Well, how do you get from the wording of that argument to the Bible? I mean, where's the link from that argument to the Bible? Because again, you could say, again, you could take the argument, as I've just suggested, replace God with Zeus, right? And then you could say, the argument proves that there is a god, and then Greek mythology proves that that god is Zeus. See, what you're saying to me is exactly Greek the same as saying that. Greek mythology did not have eyewitnesses. Well, I mean, as far no. as we know, anyone who wrote as the Bible, as I mean, you yeah. know, that came like 30 years later. But I'd also like to go back to one of the premises you were talking about earlier. You said that everything is, uh, I'm sorry, remind me of the wording, everything is either physical or conceptual, right? Right? Can you hear me? Mark, can you hear Russell? Mark. Are you there? Hello? I'm not... I'm not hearing Mark yeah, anymore. Yeah, control room, did we, did we lose Mark? Okay. Oh. All right. Hang on. We're sorry about this. The, uh, okay, technical problems. Um, also, earlier on, uh, in, ter okay. in terms of comparing God to Bigfoot, while we're waiting to get whatever issue is, is, is a problem right now. Um, we're going to put you on hold, Mark, and we're going to try again in two minutes. I'm sorry about this. Okay. Um, well, 
Bigfoot well, God Loch Ness Monster. It, I want to finish what I was saying, actually. Oh, okay, I'm about, sorry. Go ahead. So, I, I mean, the premise of this transcendental argument is that uh, everything is either physical or conceptual. And the idea is that uh, if... Uh, if these things are to exist, then the conceptual stuff must be held in the mind of something called a god, uh, uh, unless there are human minds to conceive of it. So my question, and, and I think the approach that Matt took when Matt Slick called, was which one is God? Is God physical or is God conceptual? Because uh, if God is one of those or the other, then obviously the basic issue of the question has not gone away. It's just been transferred, like who's conceiving of God or where did the physicalness of God come from? Mm -hmm. And if you say that God is neither physical nor conceptual, then you have to then, identify. Then you've, uh, you've undercut your own argument because by saying everything is mm -hmm. physical or conceptual, then you're making a special exception to the rule that you say applies to everything. And right. once you acknowledge that there's stuff that is neither physical nor conceptual, then uh, the argument doesn't Whatever. work anymore. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mark, we have no idea what happened to the audio on, yeah. on uh, getting you in here. So... Uh, um, We'd like to invite you. Maybe sorry. try try hanging up and calling back. And no, the, don't try don't that. Do, well, because that may work. And we'll, if, yeah, we'll, but let's check if, if another caller works first. Uh, well, that, yeah, because that could be the case. Because be again, the whole phone system. You know, as sorry, you know, we folks, really we've had for several been weeks having yeah. technical problems well, for a while. We'll see if we've got him back now. For a while. Uh, okay. Hey, Mark, you there? I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? I yeah, can. We could before. We just okay. I'm sorry. And last time I called the show, that was. Um, a mistake on my part, too. No okay, worries. Um, We're just glad so, to get it sorted. So what's up? Well, um, I actually uh, go to church here in Austin, and uh, there's been a, a bit of a, a discussion uh, about your show lately at my church, and um, there's actually been a lot of concern um, because uh, I don't know uh, which church you guys uh, went to, uh, but uh, we're, pretty, we're pretty much by the book. Um, and... Uh, Sure. I was, I was primarily Southern Baptist. I went to a handful of Pentecostal churches from time to time, but almost exclusively Southern Baptist. Okay. And, and, and what, 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 did, um, what did your church say about blasphemy? Um, I went to a number of different churches. I don't necessarily know that... I, I, I don't know that, that blasphemy was specifically discussed in a way that I remember. I understand that, you know, it's, it's a sin and that apostasy being the potentially unforgivable sin and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, blasphemy was wrong. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, if if, uh, if 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 when you were at church, if there was a show like um, like your show, what would you have thought about it? Do you think? You know, I thought about that a lot, and I and I'm I'm really not sure um, because I can no longer view this show through the lens that I used that I would have once viewed it through. I can I can do a pretty decent job of of thinking about how I might have looked at it. Um, I probably would have been um, concerned about the effect that it might be having on people. I mean, my parents think that I'm working for Satan, leading people to hell. Um, so, you know, I can kind of use their, their assessment mm. as a barometer. Mm. And I would have been concerned for the souls of the individuals on the show, um, you know, for fear that, that they would be lost to hell as well. Well, that's just a perfect answer. Um, my church believes heaven and hell are real places. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And uh, guess which one you're going to if you keep this up. Oh, dude. Uh, just, just, See, here we go. Take... This, why, why do you want to be our enemy? I mean, why do you, on, on purpose, choose to think bad things about us? What's wrong I'm, with you? It, I'm I, sorry. You know, uh, the it, Bible to is, be is a, really clear Never mind the freaking Bible. The, 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 it, it, do you want to be a person who can get along well with others or not? Or do you want to you know, partition yourself off into some little subgroup where if people aren't in that group with you, then they're bad? What's wrong with you? Why, 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 why is this appealing? You want to you wanna believe that me and Matt were not hurting anybody but just stating our opinion on TV that we deserve to be tortured forever? That's what you want? Cut it out. Uh, Just relax. The, we're we're a New Testament church, and and the book is pretty clear about. Sure. Well, there's your mistake. What? Why? Okay, I I understand your position. I I understand 
that you believe this, and you believe it because the Bible says so. Why should anybody else believe it? I mean, well, uh, I, mean I guess and, that's and, the reason I called, really, is, is to um, defend the faith. And the Bible says you should defend the faith. Yes, and, I, uh, I, I, I understand that, you know, First Peter 3.15, I got you. We're on the same page there. I understand what the book says. What I asked was why anybody else should believe it. Because the reason that I'm no longer a Christian is because I finally came to the understanding that my beliefs were without rational justification and without evidentiary support. So, now, and I'll, and I'll go a step further, that even if the Bible were true, even if it were, and I don't for a second think it is, and nobody has yet been able to come close to demonstrating that it's true, um, that still does not put one in a position where they are worshiping out of anything but fear of a monster that is grotesque and wants to punish people for its own problems. Now, setting aside all that, why should anybody believe what you believe? There are a million different reasons give to us believe, your best one. not just yeah, that just God is us, real, but that Christianity is the one. only way to God. Just sure. give us your best reason. What's the best reason? <sighs> well, um, it's, it's sort of, what, what exactly, uh, what exactly, Am I trying? Am I trying to demonstrate here? Uh, just that. Uh, why are you a Christian? What is the main reason why you are a Christian? Well, um, there's a lot of evidence that the Bible was divinely inspired. Such as? So, yeah. Um, there is prophecy. No, no. Such as? So, what? What is? Where? Where is? Give us a piece of evidence that shows that the Bible is divinely inspired. Okay. Um, the Bible says things about about um, about nature that uh, weren't widely known at the time. How do you know? And, and what, like, give me an example, first of all. Well, because we're talking, about, example, we're, we're talking about a book. On and, uh, oh, no. no. Uh, first of all, Matt Slick's called in. Um, the nonsense at karm.org has been refuted I don't know how many times. But we're talking about a book that, if you actually take it literally, do you think the world is six to 10,000 years old? Well, um, there's a lot of interpretation. That's, that's an um, easy yes or no question. Do you think the world is closer to six to 10,000 years old or closer to 3.5 billion years old? Well, um, I, I guess if you, if, you, um, if you take it literally, yeah, the world is uh, closer to six to 10,000 years old. Matt asked you specifically what you believe. Because we're, you know, we're trying to get well, at what is the main reason why you're a Christian, and you're dancing all around. Why can't you tell us? If you, if you, listen, if you listen back to the way you just answered the, to that, or tried to answer, or actually tried to avoid answering that last question, all I was asking was what you think, and we were going to go from there. But I, I'm, I'm happy enough with your answer that, yes, a literal view would make it six to 10,000 years old. So clearly, either you think it's six to 10,000 years old, or you're not completely a literalist. Um, but irrespective of what your position is, do you at least acknowledge that all of the scientific evidence points to an Earth that is vastly older than six to 10,000 years old? Yeah, I'm aware of that. Okay, so how do you reconcile? It doesn't prove there's no God. You're way. right, you're right. Did I say it did? I'm not saying that that proves there's no God. What I'm saying is, here's something we've learned about the universe, and it doesn't match with your literal view of the Bible. Now, there's a conflict there, and we need to resolve that. And some people resolve it in favor of the Bible, saying the Bible is absolutely right, and ignore whatever actual evidence is presented there. Um, I find that to be patently absurd because it, it turns Christianity into a self-contradictory proposition, which is, and so, by the way, does the entire idea of a revelation in the New Testament. Because your, posi your position, uh, to, to the extent that I understand it, because you haven't got a kind of a straight answer yet, is one where there is a God who has an important message for mankind. And somehow, he only reveals it to certain individuals who then write this down. And thousands of years after this initial revelation, we have to rely on copies of copies of translations of copies by anonymous authors with no originals. And the, a textual testimony to a miracle, for example, the loaves and fishes, there's no amount of reports anecdotal testimonial reports that could be sufficient to justify believing that this event actually happened as reported. No amount. And anything that would qualify as a god would clearly understand this 
and if it wanted to convey this information to people in a way that was believable, would not be relying on text to, to do so. And this, for me, is the nail in the coffin for Christianity. You, the, 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 God that, the God that Christians believe in is amazingly stupid if it wants to actually achieve its goal of spreading this information to humanity by relying on text by relying on languages that die off, by relying on anecdotal testimony. That's not a pathway to truth. And anything that would qualify for a God should know this, which means either that God doesn't exist or it doesn't care enough about those people who understand the nature of evidence to actually present it. Now, which of those possibilities do you think is, is accurate? I think you, you do need faith to believe it. Sure. And but, uh, why would you believe anything on faith? Faith isn't a pathway to truth. Everybody's, every religion has some sort of faith. People take things on, you know, if faith is your pathway, you can't distinguish between Christianity, Hinduism, Judaism, any of these others. How, how, how is it that you use reason as a path to truth in every endeavor of your life, and then when it comes to the ultimate truth, the most important truth, you're saying that faith is required? And how does that reflect on a God who supposedly exists and wants you to have this information. What kind of God requires faith instead of evidence? Well, I think you probably have faith about a lot of things, too. Like what? I have, I don't, I have reasonable expectations based on evidence. I have trust that has been earned. I will grant trust tentatively. I don't have faith. Faith is the excuse people give for believing something when they don't have evidence. And I mean, if you can come up with something that I believe that I don't have evidence for, guess what I'll do? I'll stop believing it. That's the nature of a rational mind. That is, the, that is the goal. My only goal was to be the best Christian I could be and represent this to people who didn't believe. And what I found, because I actually cared about whether or not my beliefs were true rather than whether they felt good, was that my beliefs weren't justified. Try as I might and pray as hard as I could. No answer comes. No evidence is forthcoming. And when I talk to people about this, the only answer they ever offer is the one you did, which is, well, you just got to have faith. Well, sorry, I don't. And not only do, I'm not sorry that I don't, I'm sorry for others that they think that, that I should have, because faith is not a virtue. Faith is gullibility. It's yeah. evidence that determines whether or not your perception of reality is reasonable and in conjunction with the world as it is. Well, I think uh, church gives a lot of people uh, some community and some values. Sure. So what? That has no tie to the, the truth of the supernatural claims. Church religions and churches have tons and tons of benefits for the in-group. And some of them even have benefits for some of the out-groups with, you know, feeding the homeless. Although I really wish, as many of the atheists do, we have the atheists helping the homeless group in Austin, where we will actually help the homeless without making them sit through a sermon first. Um, you know, it's, we're not holding their sandwich ransom in the name of Jesus. So you can do, there's no good thing that a church or religion does that cannot be achieved by purely secular means. And there's no benefit, positive benefit, of churches and religions that necessarily demonstrates the truth of their supernatural claims. But there, but there is, and this is my personal hobby horse today, there is a cost to deciding that you're going to take, uh, um, um, in particular, Christianity on faith. And that is that when you run into folks like us who don't believe it, you are compelled, because you have decided to believe Christianity, you are compelled to think all kinds of horrific things about us and, 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 and tell us that, uh, or come at us with these threats of eternal torment, um, which just draws a, you know, an insurmountable line between us. Yeah, or we, cannot be, we cannot be friends because of what you have decided to take on faith. That's the cost. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tell you, that, that divisive cost um, plays out not only in the previous caller who had to give up his job because of good-intentioned Christians, but I have a fiancé sitting in the room um, who is essentially estranged from a good portion of her family who consider me to be the devil. Now, I may not be a perfect person, far from it, but I'm generally a good person and a caring person, and I do whatever I can to live the best life I can. 
I certainly am not, uh, well, I, I guess if I was the devil, this is exactly what he would say, um, so who knows. Uh, but the absurdity of the divisive nature of Christianity in particular, I, and by the way, I'm an atheist with regard to all gods, uh, but since you're kind of representing Christianity, it, it just, I mean, it breaks my heart. People who actually understand what love is, people who actually understand what morality is, people who actually understand reality, it, it, it is almost unbearable to watch the people that you love be so absolutely duped into a divisive, hateful religion that they think is not divisive, they think it's inclusive, and they think it's positive. It, it kills me, and it's one of the reasons that I do this. Because I, for 25 plus years, believed this stuff. I am so happy, so happy, that I no longer think that my former roommate is destined for hell. I am so happy that despite the fact that my relationship with my parents, the nature of it has changed, I don't have to worry about them. The division is entirely one-sided. I didn't end relationships when I became an atheist. Christians ended those relationships, and it was because their particular religion cannot tolerate. My, my, I, was, I had letters from people who said, we can no longer associate with you. You are of the devil. Now, it's possible that they're right. It's possible. I don't, know, I don't know under what circumstances. But the only way that you could demonstrate that is with reason and evidence, and not faith. And I don't know how we can fix a world where people have been so convinced that they are doing the right thing out of compassion and love and trying to help people when it is absolute poison, when it is absolutely destructive. I, I wish everybody could go through what I went through so they could have a, a proper understanding of, wow, how the heck could I have believed those things that I believed? And how much better life is when you want to deal with reality on reality's terms. I mean, I know that we didn't give you a huge lot opportunity to, to express your views, but every time I asked, I got kind of a dance. And I'm, I'm happy to have you call back in, but if your whole position is that the foundation of your belief is necessarily dependent on faith, then we got nothing to talk about. Because I don't think that that's a good thing, and until you demonstrate that faith is a good thing, how could you possibly convince somebody? And, and by the way, how do you go about demonstrating that faith is a good thing without evidence? It all comes back to reason and evidence. I think he's gone again. All right. Uh, Mark, wait a minute. This welcome is, back this to is Mark. The, yeah, Hi, welcome Mark. back to the show. How are you? Hi. Last time I called, I was a bit nervous when I talked to Matt and Jeff. Yeah, you, um, you talked actually, to me the time before that too. Right. Um, yeah. I'm sorry about that. Um, it's okay. You have to understand that my church is fundamentalist, so yeah. we have um, <laughs> we have a, a very strict um, opinion, and I, I just it, it's sometimes um, nervous when you talk to someone. Um, you see, it, it's not. It's not normal for us to talk about things like this. Well, I understand it must be difficult because, I mean, when you're in a group of people who sort of all agree on stuff, it, it can be kind of jarring to have some very different opinions being expressed on the air. It's probably right. Have you ever been to our church before? No, I haven't. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying I wouldn't be willing to go sometime. Right. Well, if you, if you want to understand what we believe, just go to austinstone.org slash resources slash sermons, and there are I'm MP3s pretty, you can listen to. I'm pretty sure I actually already listened to one, but I, I don't remember which one it was. Okay, well, I think the most important sermon for you to listen to is the sermon on hell, because we believe in a literal hell. It's not a symbolic separation from God. It's a literal place. Okay, okay, and that's important to us so that we could understand that that's what you believe? So that we could understand that when the kids at our church who have become fans of your show 
um, get caught watching it, there's the parents, uh, they all got together. They were really worried because they believe if their kids watch your show, agree with you, they will literally burn. Um, well, maybe, maybe the parents should just not believe that so much. They're, they're, they're worried about their kids and... Uh, Wait a minute, can I ask a question? Yeah. Would you worship somebody that was going to burn your child to death? Well, that is... Uh, we also believe in heaven. Right, I understand. Uh, so if somebody said, you know, there's a chance that... But if I don't, you know, if your, your kid doesn't believe in me and doesn't believe that I will burn him to death, I'm going to douse him with gasoline and put a match to him. Is that somebody you would love and worship? That, that is what the Bible says. I agree. Well, I, I agree that with that's your interpretation. That, it says that in the, at the end of the age, God will round up the non-believers like wheat, like a farmer rounds up after the harvest and burn them. And you believe this, I understand, but what I'm saying is, why would you worship a God that would be so hideous? We believe that it's not, it's not shocking. Actually, it kind of is. I mean, you're saying that this God, you're afraid that this God will burn your children, you know, for all eternity, torture them, and you're saying that you don't want your children to question that, or if, you know, because if it's really true, they need to believe and worship this God like you believe and worship this God, that you're saying your concern is that this God may torture your kids forever. And I'm saying, why would you worship a God that you think would torture your children forever? We think that... We think that we deserve it for what we've done to God. That's what I mean. It's, Mark, not, shock, it's not shocking if you consider right. that we spit on God and, and trampled on his holiness, okay. that he would do that. Actually, what one of our, what one of our um, preachers, Matt Carter, said is it's shocking that he would even give us the chance to go to heaven. So if I don't believe in, yeah. if somebody doesn't, you know, if somebody spits on me, then I can douse them with gasoline and put a match to them, and you think that's perfectly reasonable. Well, actually, God is an infinite authority. So if someone were to spit on you, mm -hmm. that would be like, um, our, our preacher said, like a drop of, uh, like a raindrop in the Pacific Ocean next to what God would do. So let me get this straight, though. You're, you're saying that you, you actually teach your children then that they deserve to be tortured forever. Right? Am I and, understanding and this, this wouldn't be This wouldn't be like you offended a human. This would be like the punishment would be infinite because God's authority is infinite. It's not like if I spit on you and you tortured me. This would be like, like yeah, like he said that the comparison between your punishment and God's punishment would be like a comparison between a raindrop and the Pacific Ocean. Okay, well, can I burn, like, just your hand then? Can I, like, douse your hand in gasoline and burn it because I'm not God? I, I, it's just, it, I guess it's disturbing to me that you have a doctrine that teaches you that people deserve to be tortured forever and that you're willing to teach your children that. And also that Only you... Only if they reject God. It doesn't matter. Why, why in the world would not believing in something require that a person should be tortured forever and why would you think that's reasonable and and to, to top it all off unless you have some evidence that this god even exists why would you believe any of this well hey hang on mark let, let me try to do a little bridge building because that's what we do here on the atheist experience it. last time you called i remember that you asked matt what he would think if he were still a christian and he gave you a pretty good sort of synopsis of what he would think, and you thought that he understood it pretty well. Am I right? You remember that? Uh, let me add that my church is fundamentalist, uh, way, yeah, more, way more fundamentalist than his church. Okay, but, but he said, like, you know, I'd be concerned that, that our kids, you know, would be burned forever for, for becoming apostates, and you said, yeah, that's pretty close to what we think. So we understand where you're coming from, right? Sort of? I, I think you would understand if you were to listen to the sermons, come to the right. church. But my question to you is, do you understand where we're coming from? 
I, I mean, do, do you understand that from our point of view, we don't believe what you believe. We haven't been convinced that God is real and that the Bible is absolute truth. Uh, and, and I, I mean, you get that, right? I mean, like, you're coming at us telling us that you're afraid that your kids are going to be burned forever, and Tracy is kind of humoring you here. But really, you understand that the reason we're not taking this more seriously is because we just haven't seen any good reason to think that's true. You get that? Right. I know I'm not as charismatic as the preachers at my church, but if you listen well, to it's not the about charisma. I, I, I referenced, you will get a good idea yeah, of, but it, of what I'm, where I'm coming from. It's, it's not about charisma, really. I mean, I mean, the problem is that if you're going to rest things on, on people with charisma, I mean, like, I hate to invoke a cliche, but Hitler had charisma. He convinced a lot of people to believe a lot of horrible things about Jews, but you and I know that the things that he was, was saying weren't right, right? Yeah. So, Do you listen, have you listened to sermons before? Oh, lots of them. I used to listen to, uh, uh, what is it, KIXL in the car all the time. Sermons about hell? Sure. And, and so, I'm telling you, so you I know understand. We believe, and you know that we find you repulsive. Because I know you are leading our kids to truth. Well, no, you say that we're leading your kids to hell, but we think, and, and apparently a lot of the kids in your church also think, that this stuff really is kind of made up, that you don't have a good reason to believe it. You see where yeah. they're coming from? I mean, you know, they're really, you know, their parents are probably coming down on them hard, grounding right. them, you know, threatening them with the most horrible punishments. Instead and, of and giving the them some evidence for saying, why we're wrong. Right. And the other thing, I mean, just to give you some background, I'm ex-Church of Christ, so I understand hell completely. We and had literal hell. I'm not. Hell, I mean, I was born and, an atheist. And I don't believe it anymore. And when somebody says to me, that they're not concerned about demonstrating their God is real, but they're willing to still go forward and teach, despite the fact that they can't make a demonstration that any of it's real, that they're going to go ahead and teach their children that they're deserving of eternal torture and that you know, this is not a problem. Um, I have a problem with what you're teaching your kids, frankly. I think that it's, it's damaging. And I think that it's a horrible thing for a parent to tell their children, I think you deserve eternal torture, especially if they can't really demonstrate that there's any reality behind that claim. There is a logical argument. Uh, our, our preacher told us, he, he told us the logical argument. If you offend your parents, they might ground you or spank you. Yeah, but again, if, if I'm still offend, not sure if, you if you're getting this. If you offend the Supreme Court, they might lock you up. And if you offend God, his authority is even bigger, so the punishment is bigger. Okay, I don't believe right. your God is real. Okay, so I think you are basically f making your children afraid of the monster under the bed and telling them that there's something to fear there when there is nothing there. And the fact that you believe there's something there but can't demonstrate it doesn't help your case. How, how would I demonstrate to you? You have to pray. You have to read the Bible. No, you no. If, you, if something is real, if this mug is real, you don't have to pray to know that it's real. When something is real, and when you want to demonstrate that it's part of existent reality, you make a demonstration of the existence of the thing. That's how you tell the difference between things that exist and things that don't. Where is your demonstration that this God manifests in some way that is demonstrable and differentiable, that can be differentiated from um, something that's not God? I, I don't understand your question. Okay, this mug is this that's, mug. It's yeah. not something else, right? Here's the mug. And if you wanted, for example, to demonstrate air, like some people will say you can't see air, but I can blow up a balloon and show you, hey, you can see that it expands, that I'm putting something into it, even if you can't see it. You can make a demonstration of a thing that exists. If something doesn't manifest in some way that you can demonstrate, how do you tell the difference between that thing that doesn't manifest in some way that you can demonstrate and a thing that doesn't exist? Well, Mark, I, I mean, like, let me ask you, you don't need faith to determine that your mom exists right 
I no. Mean, you don't have to pray to your to your mom or, or you know hope for a special sign because you know you can actually go and hang out with her. She can you know you have you can have photographic history of her. You can come face to face with her. When she talks to you, she doesn't appear as a vague feeling in your head or some sort of uh, you know result after you pray or we would say talk to yourself. You go to your mom and you say hi, and she says hi back, and everyone can see her, and everyone sees the same thing. A lot of people can see God. Everyone at my church can see God. But they don't seem to see the same thing because there are like you know three hundred thousand different different denominations, or was it thirty thousand de denominations of Christianity alone, and they all seem to think like you were very careful to specify that um, your church is fundamentalist. Because you want to distinguish yourself from those other non-fundamentalist churches who obviously think completely different things about God, right? We have, <clears throat> let, let me just explain something to you quickly. We have an affirmation of faith and value. So you, okay? so you agree is, to, wait, let's see. Right. go ahead. The Bible is the word of God. Mm -hmm. There is one true and living God who exists in three persons, God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Right. God created all things for His glory. Men and women were created in the image of God. God alone is the architect and finisher of our salvation. The Holy Spirit gives gifts to His children. The church consists of all who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for their eternal salvation. Heaven and hell are real places. Jesus Christ will one day return to establish his kingdom. Everyone in my church believes that. So, so it sounds like you have to go to a lot of work to have people recite all this stuff to make sure that they're on the same we page. We have sermons every Sunday. We just had one today. Right, so you have one guy telling everybody what to believe, and sure enough, they all agree. I don't need sermons to tell me that my the, mom is. The other question is, while it's fine, you know, we do usually ask people, what do you believe and why? And you're very good at explaining what you believe, and yet I have no understanding yet, <laughs> even, you know, as long as we've been on the call, I have yet right, no yeah. understanding why you believe it. None whatsoever. Why do you believe these things that you believe? What makes you think they're true? When you were Christian, why did you believe it? Because I was indoctrinated to believe it. Because people said sermons that <laughs> yeah. said it was real and made you sign statements of faith and it and was told the same to, reason that children believe in Santa Claus. The only difference was that I was engulfed in a whole society and my parents really believed it. So that what happened was I was surrounded <clears throat> by people that at no point in my childhood said, okay, we're about to tell you now Santa's not real. They don't do that with Jesus with you or with this, this doctrine with you. And so what happens is you end up embroiled in a culture of adults who believe this stuff because they've never thought about it and never questioned it. And the fact that you keep giving us what you believe, which is fine, we're interested in what you believe, but you seem to not provide why you believe it. What makes you believe that this is actually true? I'll tell you that my church would hate you. That's if fine. you were to compare God to Bigfoot or Santa Claus... I don't care. I don't care if they would hate me. I don't I, care at all. That's one reason why I haven't gone to your church. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me, though, how they would feel about mm. me. What I'm wondering is why they believe that what they believe is true. I don't care what they feel about me. I don't care what their beliefs are at this point, because we've heard plenty of what they believe, but I have not heard one bit about how they justify it as true. It's not science. It's not experiments. Right. But what, like that. That. what is the justification for believing that this is true? Over, over something else. I mean, you know, what, what would you say to uh, a Jehovah's Witness or something who, who thought that you were completely wrong? Well, we don't usually talk to Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, I mean, maybe that's your problem. Maybe, maybe you're so worried that, uh, you know, that, that you're going to be led down a path of lies and that I, you I've haven't got a, I have to consider interesting... that, some, that other people might Jeez. have valuable input. I have a question, just a real quick, and this is just sort of a more interesting thing from my perspective. You said before that you don't usually talk about these things with people. I think you said that early on in the call. And then you just said you don't talk to Jehovah's Witnesses. 
I was raised in a very fundamentalist church, and one of the things we were very big on was saving unbelievers, especially people we thought who were in error. I mean, I was preaching all the time everywhere I went. Try anybody I thought was wrong, I would engage them. And you seem to be telling me that that's not your policy. And Does yet the Bible an indicates, well, the Bible indicates that you should be seeking and saving the we lost. We send people to Africa. We send people all over the world. We fly them. We fund them. We pray for them. We equip them. That means teach them right. the but, message. But you personally would, would not engage a Jehovah Witness even though you think they're going to go to hell if you don't, if you don't save them. Is that correct? We do, we do global missions. <laughs> but if a Jehovah Witness came to your door, you would not engage them? You would let them run off and just burn in hell and, according to your doctrine. And that wouldn't bother you at all? We try, but what I mean is, at my church, we all have the same beliefs. Sure. That's why you're a, you know, a denomination or a non-denominational right. group. How so you? we don't do this sort of thing very much. We don't usually have debates at my church. Not within the church, I understand, but it seems Maybe like you, you would... try. I mean, when I, was, when I was a fundamentalist Christian, I was proselytizing as much as I could to anybody that would listen. I, I have to throw out Matt's favorite verse because he would yeah, want to if Peter he was 3, here. 15, uh, yeah, sure. 1 Peter 3.15 says, uh, In your hearts acknowledge Christ as the Holy Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So, I mean, you know, it seems to me that if you wanted to follow the Bible religiously, so to speak, uh, you would want to go out and engage people and, and tell them the reasons that you We think. do that a lot. What I mean is, I, I fund these things. I don't actually do them. Can okay? I I'm not you? a saint. I'm not perfect. And I don't always have the confidence to, to preach, to convert people myself. But the church funds it, so I, I pay for this. So he sees this as sort of like a group command. Can I ask you, what is your role in the church? I mean, I've actually been personally curious, because you've called three times now, and I'm not sure if you're like a, a like in a leadership position, or if you're sort of a, a one of these other... No, member. It's a member of the church. I'm not okay. a preacher That's fine. or... What, what's, your relation, what's your relation to these kids who are... Um, becoming fans to your chagrin what i mean what how, oh, how well do you know kids. Them? your friend's kids he's a member in the church and this is the <clears throat> church's children have you talked to the kids yourself and see what they say i mean well they watch it on youtube okay, uh, okay. they're watching the, the, the videos um Someone sent them the videos on YouTube, and they watched them. Have, have they seen the other videos where you called? Yeah. Well, they're watching right now. Oh. Okay, Hi, well, kids. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out. Um. They, they always tell me, they say, that sometimes they don't, sometimes they don't, uh, when we, when we uh, talk to them, uh, they, they're, um, how do I say this? They're really proud of Matt. They think Matt will answer the question. Oh, so maybe must... they don't, we ask them about evolution. They say, well, t ask Matt, he'll tell you. Or call in, uh, ask Matt, he'll tell you. Or they show us a video when Matt tells them. But we want, mm. so they, they just use Matt. I... Uh, they don't think for themselves. For the record, I, if I were, since I'm in a position now to give a message to those kids, I think that you should actually go and study the science and not rely on an authority figure. Absolutely, I agree. Uh, to, uh, I mean, because you should study the scientific evidence and figure it out for yourself, and you should seriously consider the sermons coming out of your church. And, uh, and figure out, I mean, if you think they don't make sense, maybe you should engage Mark in a conversation and, and tell him what you think of them, not what Matt thinks of them. Yeah, uh, I, I absolutely agree. And Mark, let me, let me just say that, you know, on this, I think Russell's right on. And, it, and if this is your concern, I would agree with you. I don't think that the kids, even though children, I do think, require leadership, I, don't want I would never want a child to be replacing blind faith in one thing for blind faith in another. Especially not Matt. 
<laughs> so I, I don't think that anybody should be watching our show and just simply, you know, believing everything that comes out of Matt's mouth or any one of the co-hosts or anybody on this program. My goal, and I've told people this a lot, they'll say something about why, would you, why do you want people to follow you? And I say, I don't ever want anyone to follow me. That's not yeah. my goal. I want them to think for themselves and to, you know, figure this out. That's definitely the goal. And so um, on that, I think we're all three agreed. Yeah, and don't believe what I say. I, I don't think that they should be punished so harshly. I think they should be allowed to watch the videos, but other Good. parents are pretty strict, and they grounded their kids and don't let their kids go on the Internet to watch these videos because they're scared. They think, they think Jesus should be their hero, not Matt. Well, if I can offer some constructive criticism as a parent... I think that that is probably, if they're really worried about their kids coming back to their side, that's probably the worst thing they could do. I mean, I'm not going to offer suggestions about how they can come back to Christianity because obviously I don't care. But um, it, I, I think that if I treated my kid that way, if I said, you may not watch this, you may not go on the Internet, you, know, you may not listen to these atheists, um, the first reaction that a teenager would have is, what are they hiding? Well, and, some churches don't even let their kids read Harry Potter. Yeah, and I think that's, that's equally as absurd. I think that's too strict. Right. I, I think that I, 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 we, we might agree, Matt, since, I mean, uh, Mark. Mark, since you're saying that, you know, you, you're not sure that they shouldn't be allowed to watch the program, I always think that a better alternative, especially if the parents have good reasons for what they believe, it seems like this would be an opportunity for them to allow the children to watch the program, perhaps watch it with them, and then explain to the kids where the reasoning is incorrect or where the evidence is, you know, pointing somewhere different than where someone here might be saying it. And so they could actually engage their children in a conversation, explain why they're right and why this program is incorrect. Mm. Um, and, and, and that way rebut the show there with the children. And, and it almost makes me wonder if, the, and I understand this isn't all the parents in your congregation, it's just some of them, but it makes me wonder if those parents might not have raised children by modeling just blind faith and following without questioning. Because it seems like the kids definitely have that attitude according to what you're describing. And it sounds like if the parents had good reasons for what they believed, they wouldn't be threatened by someone telling their kids something incorrect because then they would be able to point out the errors in what's being said and demonstrate to the children that in fact what they're saying as the parent is correct. You're right. Um, but you're naive because they'll never watch the videos with the kids. Well, then it sounds oh, to no, me like I, the I agree with you, you that they won't. talking to are the parents and not the kids or us. Yeah, Maybe. I agree with you that they won't. I just think that's bad parental policy, and it makes me wonder if the parents themselves aren't responsible for their children's attitude of just believing whatever someone says, because it sounds like these parents themselves don't have good reasons for what they believe, or they'd be able to offer that to their kids and not be threatened by someone telling their children something different. Maybe you should convince the pastors in your church to do some sermons about effective parenting strategies and, and you know, in engaging with what your kids are involved with That's instead of um, burying their heads in the sand. Yeah, um, I guess you went to church, so you know that it's not a debate society. Correct. But you also understand, I understand that it's not a debate society for the parents, but when you're raising the children and they're trying to make determinations, there definitely has to be discussion. I mean, those children are not members yet, I'm assuming, or some of them might be in wavering. It seems like at the point that you have young people who are making decisions about whether or not to join the church and become a member, that it would require some discussion at that point with the children. I mean, I understand that the adult members who have joined are all in agreement, but clearly the kids who are being raised are being encouraged to join, but they, many of them probably have not yet. Well, you see, my church believes that it's, if your kid leaves the church, um, that's really bad. Oh, no, I understand what you, what you believe on that. I do get it. But what I'm saying is that that just means to me, when, you're, when you said the church group itself is not a debate society, believe me, I understand that the preacher's not going to up, get up there and give a sermon to convince people a God exists because everybody at your church already accepts that. But they, they, would so, they would sooner disown their kids, kick them out of the house, then sit and well, watch the atheist experience. It, it seems them. to me that that's what's probably going to wind up happening. Yeah, and, I and think those nobody's children gonna are going to have the worst um, time of it. I, I wonder, how come none of these kids have called up yet? 
Uh, some of them have. Yeah, they might have. Have they? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, well, if you, if I you guys are in the audience. Emailed. If you guys are in the uh, audience, uh, you should call and let us know that you're a member of Mark's church so that we can get your perspective well, on this. Well, except I just want to put a, you know, put a word in. Don't do that if you think you're going to suffer any kind of parental repercussions. Yeah, I mean, sure. after what I mean, Mark just said about some parents might rather disown you, you, I don't want something. you calling up and having your voice recognized and get you into trouble. Right. So don't call unless you think that it's okay you know, with your parents or that it's not going to cause a problem for you. Yeah, but I mean, I'd welcome any other members of your church as well as you to call in any time. <laughs> Time, including the parents who hate us and think we're disgusting, uh, including uh, you know the the pastors who you say are much more persuasive than you, and including the kids who uh, you know enjoy watching us. Uh, you know we'd like to hear from as many perspectives as we can. Yeah, anyone yeah, should feel they, would, they wouldn't call because they'd worry, but they'd email probably, so it was just private. Right. Well, if you so email me, no way their parents could find out. If you email, also let us know you're a member of Mark's church. All right, I think we've we've taken over half the show, and uh, you're welcome to call back another week, Mark. And uh, Thank as you. always, enjoy the conversation. Thanks very much, Mark. Okay, God bless you. <laughs> Thank you for thinking that we'll do something. It's uh, intended as a nice thing. What? It's intended yes, nicely. I know. We want to pick up Anthony. Hey, Mark. Hi, Matt. Um, I, I wanted to talk about values. Last, last time I called, I talked about beliefs, and I don't think you share a lot of our beliefs. I, um, there, there I agree. Um, our, our, we have uh, an affirmation of faith and values, and uh, the faith is, the faith is uh, the Bible is the word of God. You don't believe that, right? Correct. Um, there is one true and living God who exists in three persons, God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, did you believe that before? Sure, I used to believe it. Don't believe it. God created all things for his glory. Yeah, don't believe you, that. You don't believe in God or any God made anything? Yeah, I, I'm not even sure I believe this is actually Mark. Uh, this is Mark. I, I talked to you before. Well, okay. Everybody knows that, and anybody can, yeah. you know, try to, to fake what you're saying. How do I know it's Mark? Well, I, I go to the Austin Stone Church. Uh, sure, you said yeah, that every time you called in. What do you want to know? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't have any way of telling. So, I mean, um, what, is it you, what is it you wanted to address? Well, we have, we have values, too. Sure. Um, an authentic and intimate relationship with God. Hey, hey, Mark, do you have any original thoughts, or are you just going to keep reading me what your church says? Well, I just wanted to know what, what values you believe. I, well, there's lots of things that I value. Um, love, happiness, health, those types of things. Um, I've given an entire talk on the superiority of secular morality, and how you can begin with very, very simple beginnings and establish values that build up to a more complicated moral system. What about submission to the God of the Bible? Why, why, why would you would... even ask something so silly? Why would I believe to, uh, why would I have a value that has me submit to something I don't believe in? You know what else? I, I, I won't submit to anything in the sense that you're talking about it. Well, last time I talked to Tracy, she said God was just like Santa Claus. Sure. Yep. From our point of view, um, I mean, I, I even go one further. Um, we've compared God and, and other supernatural claims that aren't supported by evidence. We've compared them to Santa Claus, leprechauns, all kinds of things. And I'll go a step further and say that leprechauns are, by definition, uh, as are most cryptozoic things, uh, or cryptozoological things more plausible than your God simply because they are less powerful. It's more likely that there's a magical fairy out there who can do some things than that there's a magical transcendent being who can do anything. Now, I think they're both absurdly implausible, but if we're going to compare the two, fairies win. You don't believe in fairies, do you? 
No. So why uh, do you? No one. No one believed in that. Well, no yeah, one yes, believed. actually, yes, actually, there are people who believe in that kind of thing, um, and the Cottingley Fairies hoax demonstrated this quite nicely when even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle believed that he had evidence of fairies. So your, your claim that nobody believes it, not only is wrong, but it's irrelevant. What difference does it make if somebody believes it? I asked whether or not you believed it, and you said no. Now, how is it you can say no, you don't believe something that's more plausible than God, yet still believe in God? Well, there's, there's no Bible for fairies. There's no religion for fairies. So, so, so what? Why, why is the Bible relevant? I mean, there's a Quran. You don't believe in Allah, do you? No. Okay, so can we agree at least that the Bible's irrelevant to whether or not there is a God? I mean, well, a lot of people read the Bible at my church. We just read this morning. Okay. What did you read this morning? We read sermons. This time it was about heaven. Okay. And so a lot of people read it, and, and you think that's enough to say that it's worth believing? Because a lot of people have read Harry Potter. Yeah, but you believed it too, so are you... Yes, Are I you did. Are admitting that you're, you're dumb too? No, and I'm not saying you're dumb. I'm saying that I used to believe it, and then when I investigated why I believed it, I found that I didn't have any good reason to believe it. And why do you think you believed it for 20 years? Because I was wrong. I did not realize that I didn't have a good reason, and as soon as I did realize that, I stopped believing. The difference is that when you come up a, against a wall in, in pr trying to prevent some reason for you to believe it, you just stop thinking. You don't stop believing. I was wrong. That doesn't mean I was any, any more stupid. Was I dumber with regard to the truth of biblical things? You bet. Was I, was I an idiot with regard to whether or not a God exists? Yes. But that doesn't change who I am. Being wrong about something or being stupid in one area or being uninformed in an area or dumb or whatever label you want to put on it doesn't mean that you or I as a person is completely stupid. I'm dumb. I am an idiot about a great many things, including, as we've seen in the last week or so, finances. I'm a moron when it comes to investigate, investing and, and managing my money in a reasonable way. It's something that I've always had to deal with. But does that mean I'm an idiot across the board? Of course not. But I do at least recognize that I have this issue, and so I'm getting help with it. Well, well, Mark, I, mean, I, have, I have a question for you. Yeah. Why do you believe? Well, I think, I think maybe, like, last time I talked to Tracy, she said she was indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. And okay. I don't know, like, what, I, I don't know exactly what indoctrination means, but... It means you were brought up in an environment that yeah. encouraged a belief without evidence to support it. Right. But the, when, when parents indoctrinate their kids for Santa Claus, kids don't believe it anymore, but they still believe in God. But the, the difference is that at some point the kids realize that Santa Claus doesn't make sense. And at that point, parents stop reinforcing that belief. Or in the case of my kid, he never believed in Santa Claus. So you mean if we stop reinforcing this belief, then we'll stop believing it? I, I, yes. Yes. Um, you it, think if people stop going to church, they'll stop believing it? No. No, I think if parents stop reinforcing these beliefs, stop teaching their kids that this is literally true, then, the, then yeah, people will stop believing it. You, you're, you're confusing the scope of this. On an individual level, there's no guarantee that any person who stops going to church is going to stop believing. But I will say that the people who escape and avoid the constant reinforcement and constantly being surrounded by people who, who believe that stuff, those people are more likely to stop believing. That's just a demonstrable fact. It's the reason why groups like the American Family Association are worried about kids who go off to college because the number of college students who abandon their religious beliefs within the first couple of years is staggering. And it's the reason why you and some others are worried about youth in your church who are watching this program and getting ideas. And because on some level, on some level, and I know this is insulting and I'm, I apologize, but we've had a number of conversations, and whenever you've been asked why you believe something, you have yet 
to give anything other than because a pastor said so or because a sermon said so. You haven't expressed any actual reason on your own, any thought behind what your beliefs are. And when I think, no matter how insulting this is, that you are aware on some level that you have no good reason for your beliefs and you're worried that nobody actually does, otherwise you would not have any concern at all about whether or not a kid is exposed to additional information. Because I'm not sitting here at, in this chair on the show asserting that your beliefs are false. I'm simply saying that your beliefs have not met their burden of proof that you guys haven't been able to provide, meet the standards of evidence that any reasonable claim should be. There's absolutely nothing objectionable that, about that. It's true, you guys wouldn't object to this sort of comment with regard to any other claim. If I said that Bigfoot hadn't met its claims, you'd be okay with that, and the same thing with fairies. But because it's something about something you believe, you're going to object to it. And I think that this betrays your own doubts about what you believe. And all I'm saying is that's not a bad thing. Embrace it, don't be afraid of it, because if it's true, if your beliefs are true, the truth has absolutely nothing to fear from investigation. If, you, if something is true, the more you investigate it, the more brightly the light should shine and expose that truth. And you what I in a hide, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, when you were a Christian, what would you say if I said, what, what's your reason? Um, my reason at the time for why I was a Christian? Yeah. I don't know that I would have given a good answer. Um, I probably so you would have been just like me. I, I, yeah, yes. Yes. So you're being hypocritical. No. How no. am I being hypocritical? I am encouraging you to take... I, I've already said I was in the same position you were in, Mark. I'm not being hypocritical. I am encouraging you to take the steps that I took and embrace your critical thinking skills and to foster your critical thinking skills so that you have a good understanding of what sort of evidence you need. What, what have I said that's hypocritical? Well... You just said you don't have a reason, but you didn't have a reason either. Right. Exactly. And, and that I'm was saying what was that wrong was with dumb, it. dumb, that it was unreasonable to believe something. And as soon as I realized that I didn't have a good reason, I stopped believing. Well, okay. I Look, I, I know I'm on your side on a few things. Like, a lot of people at my church uh, say, like, if, if the Bible says uh, if you if you're a man and and, and you um, you have sex with another man, that's an abomination. Yep. So so I don't like that. I know that that's not that, that's not Christian because uh, he said you should love your neighbor. You know, some things in the Bible are good, like you should love your neighbor, and some things. Like, okay, how, well, do you, how do you go about deciding what's, what, what in the Bible's right and what in the Bible's wrong? Well, you know what, you know what, can I just say one thing? You know, uh, some, some people say they, they're Christian, but some of the people who are Christian, uh, they like war or they like something like that. So they're not true Christians? I don't care about what some Christians do. The question I'm asking is, I agree with you. There are some true things in the Bible and some false things in the Bible. We're in agreement. How do you tell the difference? You just, uh, well, you just know that, like, Jesus was good because he no, said you no, should. No, 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 no. You don't just know. There is a pathway to truth. There is a pathway to discover whether or not something's true. And saying you just know it is not included in that pathway. So if I were to tell you anything else, how would you go about figuring out whether it was true or false? Um, well, you'd have to, um, like, uh, what's an example? Um, like the age of the Earth? Sure. Well, I know, like, scientists found a lot of fossils and things. We don't, we don't determine the age of the Earth with fossils. But in any case, what but, you're talking about there is evidence. Okay? Yeah. Now, let's get away with physical truths about the physical nature of the universe, because that's fairly simple. 
um, despite the fact that your Bible gets a number of things wrong, like whether or not bats are birds and whether or not rabbits chew the cud, uh, I dismiss that as the ignorance of the people who wrote it. And so, by the way, do most Christians, because they recognize there's no way to reconcile this with an all-knowing God. But let's talk about moral things. The Bible is clear that having, a man having sex with another man is an abomination, yet you disagree with the Bible. I do too. No, I don't think they should be so mean to gay people. I, I, well, I, I completely agree, but your Bible says that your God says it's an abomination. Not now, only that, but, but you're supposed to stone gay people. We can probably get out of here in 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, I don't think you should stone gay people. Yet, yet the, but the Bible says you're supposed to. Actually, says right. you're deserving. I don't believe everything. Oh, yeah, deserving of so, okay. so there's some things in the Bible you believe and some things you don't believe. And I'm asking, I understand your reason or your explanation for why you don't believe them, um, but you, let's, you're right here. Oh, you can't see me. Um, so you reject some things in the Bible and accept some other things in the Bible. And somebody else in your church disagrees with you. And they accept some things in the Bible that you reject, and they reject some things that you accept. How do the two of you decide who's actually correct? I don't, I don't know. Don't you think that's important to find out? Yeah, like there's Muslims, there's all sorts of different religions. Well, we're not even talking yeah, about I'm that. Just talking we're talking about, about in your church. Stone church, Austin. I mean, do, are you are you saying that nobody, everybody there agrees with you that there's nothing wrong with being gay? I'm pretty sure that there are people at Stone Church who would say that the Leviticus passage is about it being an abomination for a man to lie with another man is actually the opinion of God. Now that puts you in disagreement with somebody at your church, hypothetically. How would you go about resolving this? How do you find out who's right? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Don't you think that's something you should know? Yeah. So, um, May, well, maybe you should just maybe you should just uh, uh, make friends with some gay people and and uh, and see if they're bad people. What what difference does that make? I mean, maybe well, to see to see if it's true that they're an abomination. Well, no, no, no. But the passage means it's an abomination to God, that God thinks it's evil. It doesn't matter to God whether gays are good or not. So you, right. you so going out and meeting them doesn't tell us anything. And you could meet a homosexual who's an axe murderer, and you can meet a homosexual who gives up all their time um, to charities. But that tells us nothing at all about it, because people aren't all the same. What okay, we're, so maybe you should maybe you should look at the other things Jesus said, like love your neighbor, and compare that with Leviticus. Okay, and so now you've got a well. First of all, love your neighbor is kind of generic. I mean, I don't know yeah. that it necessarily means intercourse, uh, <laughs> but you know, say, saying love your neighbor um, in one passage and saying kill the people. Uh, and there's a passage that says that if anybody tries to lead you to another god including your wife, yours should be the first hand on them to put them to death. So you've got one passage that tells you to kill somebody who leads you to another god, and another passage that tells you to love them. Now, which one do you follow and why? The love. Why? Why? It's just like an instinct. Okay. Um, well, I'll praise you for having instincts that seem to be more moral than, than the, the contrary, <laughs> But it seems to me that if you're just going to go on instinct, um, why, why do you believe anything about the Bible or this God or Jesus or whatever if you have given yourself the authority to go through and pick the parts of the book that you instinctively feel are true? So maybe I should just trust myself, not even listen to the Bible. Amen. There you go. Everybody here is clapping for you, Mark. Everybody. Now, here's the thing. Don't just listen to yourself. Because you can be wrong. I can be wrong. Jen can be wrong. We've all been wrong before. You have to actually make a concerted effort and look at what's going on around you and have conversations with other people. Because how do we decide whether or not we consider something to be moral or immoral? 
Um, it has nothing to do with what some old book said or somebody else's opinion. It has to do with the consequences of that action and realizing that your actions have impact on other people and their actions have an impact on you. And when those, when those, these, those things come in conflict, that's where we make vi uh, assessments with respect to our values. And yeah, because when gay people have sex, it doesn't hurt anyone else. Yes. Unless, unless like, they hurt each other. Well, you know, uh, we'll assume it's consensual. I know plenty of people who hurt each other in sex and are really happy about it. Uh, but we'll save that for another time. I got to go, Mark. Thanks for the call. Come to my church sometime. I, May 15th, I'll be there. We really like you. May 15th. Bye-bye. Look, we have a caller from Austin, Texas. I don't know where this wow. is. Bob, can you tell us where Austin is? <laughs> What do you mean? Well, we tend to not get any calls from the Austin area because we broadcast over the internet. So you're like the first caller that's from Austin in I don't know how long. So how you doing? Well, I'm doing good. I've actually got a proof for God. It's, do you know who Chris Langan is? Uh, I don't. No, but that name sounds familiar. Yeah, well, he has a proof oh. for God, and he's a certified genius. He has an IQ of 210. It's higher than Einstein. Uh -huh. Okay. Sounds like an argument from authority, but keep going. Well, I just wanted to introduce it to you, uh, just so you know that it's not some crazy guy. Well, okay. it doesn't. See, that's a, the point that I kind of made last week by dressing up in drag, is that the validity of an argument isn't impacted in any way by who makes it. So um, there are plenty of people who have, are, are brilliant in a number of areas um, who are stupid in other areas or just incorrect in other areas. So Yeah, I understand. Just see the argument for yourself. It's called... Well, just search his name on Wikipedia and YouTube, and you can find it. And uh, he's proven it. So I, I kind of wonder why you guys haven't talked about that one yet. Maybe you're scared to, to address that one. Uh, I can tell you why. Because if any physicist or mathematician actually proved God, it would be front page news around the world, and none of us would have to bother wasting any time discussing it. Instead, what you're probably talking about is one of many crackpot theories coming from some otherwise brilliant people that has been largely discredited by their peers. Now, so, you got to remember, uh, it, sometimes it, people are ahead of the time. Yeah, and sometimes they're not. <laughs> and the time to believe them is when you've actually demonstrated that, they, that they're the right. We, so, all right. It, well, we'd be happy to look at it. So I, we'll, will, we'll look at it. So I will we'll now you can't, you, can't say, you can't say you don't know about it. You can't use that excuse anymore because I told you about it. Well, I don't sure. even know what it is exactly. Well, actually, I can still use that excuse as long as I don't actually go look at it, but I will go look at it. Um, and it may be that I've seen this before and dismissed it because if it's one intelligent person making an argument and it hasn't been peer-reviewed or supported by anybody or if it's been discredited by others, then I don't need to waste any more time on it, now so, do I? So maybe you could, uh, Bob, maybe you could give us a one or two sentence version of, of what it's about. Well, I'll just let you take a look at it, but he proves, he proves from quantum physics and math and philosophy and logic that um, the universe uh, is like a mind, and the question, whose mind? Well, that's God's mind. Yeah, um, there, are, there isn't anything in math that equals mind or God's mind. There isn't anything in physics that equals mind or God's mind. And there isn't anything in quantum physics that equals mind or God's mind. So, no, you don't, so, you don't know so, that yet. It, it, so, <laughs> so, without being able to introduce those variables, I think he's a nut. But I'll look it up. Look it up because he says this argument is as, as, as irrefutable as 2 plus 2 equals 4, he says. Well, okay. you know. Okay. Lots we'll, of people we'll take a say things. I, 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 would I would highly recommend that you stop depending on so and somebody asserting very strongly that something is true and actually dig around and look beyond it because those mathematical disciplines don't have within them the concepts of minds, which means at best he's making an argument by analogy, which doesn't prove anything. Or misapplying the, the, the and science. And I'm sorry, because people will call in to say, well, Einstein believed in a god. Well, yeah, he believed in, you know, the Spinoza's god, the law of the universe, a thing as a god, as a metaphor type thing. And whenever they raise this, they raise it as if, well, since you don't believe in a god, do you think you're smarter than Einstein? No, I'm not saying he believes in it. I'm saying he's got an argument for it with mathematics. Okay, if, if, he, okay. if he's well, we'll got an argument that he says is irrefutable and he doesn't believe it, then he's even crazier than I thought. Okay. But thanks. Tell me the guy's name again, real quick. 
Chris, Chris Langan. Langan, L-A-N-G-A-N. Okay. And just one other thing before I go, I'll, sure. I'll just take this off there. What makes you think that God is supposed to be moral? Last time, the last call you were whining about 50 billion children dead. Well, what makes you think in the Bible that he's supposed to save people? Um, I, I don't, okay, we're, whew, wow. In that particular case, we're talking about a particular definition of God where God is predis predefined to be moral. Christians think their God is moral. That they, they think he is the perfectly moral being the in the universe. Of human morality, I don't right? think that thing exists. I don't think that a God necessarily needs to be moral. I think that it's just as likely if a God is out there that it is immoral or amoral um, or no, no more moral than anybody else. I'm not doing the defining here. This is, this is the traditional philosophical problem of evil, otherwise known as theodicy, which depends on a specific definition of a god. Um, we weren't just sitting around whining about how immoral a god is, we were talking about a specific philosophical argument that predefines God to be moral. Yeah, well I don't think God, I don't think God owes us anything, I think we betrayed him and he's getting his revenge on us. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry that you have been convinced of something so absurd that you are willing to shrug off your, your own self-worth um, for what can only be described as monstrous. Clearly the God you believe in is not morally good. If you had children and they betrayed you and say they slapped you in the face... Sure, would I throw them in the basement and torture them forever? No, because that's immoral and wrong. <laughs> what do you mean? If they're your children, you yep. made them, they're supposed to love you. Do you think it would be okay for you to throw your children in the basement and torture, torture them for the rest of their lives um, because they don't love you and because they betrayed you? This is by Do you think that's morally the correct? Well, Matt's making yeah, an that's analogy to the Christian God. Think right. about it some more, Bob. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Uh, Thomas in London, how are you? Hi, I'm a Christian. I'm from London, and I believe in Jesus and all that stuff. And I'm not happy with what you did to Kenny on the last show. I thought that you cut him off, and it doesn't look good on you because it looks like you were trying to block him from his argument. Yeah, I already, I already apologized. I, I partially agree with you, um, although, to be fair, um, I, think it, I think Kenny pretty much called to, to preach, and it was difficult to, uh, that he didn't understand that not only could he not make the case that he thought he could make, um, but that it wouldn't have have done him any good towards his arguments as well. And Kenny's welcome to call back, and, and I'll apologize to him in person. But uh, all, all I mean is that if you, if you want to make him do that on email, that's okay, because it's long. But what I mean is if you cut him off and then the rest of the show is all atheists, it looks pretty bad because the one call that was going to challenge you, you cut that off, and then the rest is just preaching to the choir. Sure, and, and to be fair, um, you'll be interested to know that uh, we've specifically set aside two of the four lines to make sure that we get theistic callers because we've been we're, we're not fans at all of having nothing but atheists call in that said um, I was not remotely about to be challenged uh, when somebody claims that they can demonstrate the authorship of the Gospels when the entire collection of New Testament scholars from within Christendom and without are in a consensus agreement that without the autographs and with nothing more than uh, church kind of uh, history uh, attributing names to these, that it simply cannot be done, um, then a caller's just kind of wasting time. I mean, it, it would almost be like somebody um, calling in to say that, that, they could, that they had scientific evidence for ESP, but they didn't have any actual data or tests or studies. They just felt that they could demonstrate it. But I, did, you have, did you have a question or a comment outside yeah, I of Kenny? Yeah, where you think that, well, first of all, I wanted to say that we don't have eyewitness accounts for a lot of historical events. Like if you look sure. at Alexander the Great, we don't, we, I, I assume you believe Alexander the Great took over the world um, when he was 30 years old, but you don't have any eyewitness accounts of that, so you're being a bit biased there, don't you think? Um, my, my requirement isn't anything about eyewitness accounts um, because here's the thing. You can go right now and find somebody who claims to have been abducted by aliens and you can get an eyewitness account direct from that individual. Does that mean that what they're claiming is true? Does it mean it's not true? No, it doesn't, but the burden of proof is on those who are claiming that it is true. And when you talk about 
whether or not Alexander the Great existed and conquered the world, there is considerable evidence for that, and it's a fairly mundane claim. When you talk about whether or not somebody was a god and walked on water and raised the dead, all of a sudden, even if you had a thousand eyewitness testimonies that were certified, that had survived throughout history, that's still not sufficient to prove that that, what, that, that actually happened. So you're being biased because it's a miracle, you don't believe in miracles, you're saying you need more no. evidence than, than something else. Um, uh, I, I, I reject your claim that I, well, I don't know what you mean by being biased, because not all claims are created equal. Um, the claim that you, you have a pet dog doesn't require much evidence at all. But the claim that you have a pet dragon is an extraordinary claim, and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Are well, you, are you saying, deciding, are you really? deciding that it's extra extraordinary, that's what you atheists do, you decide what you think is extraordinary. Well, do you not think it's an extraordinary claim that somebody was a god and performed miracles that defy the known laws of the universe? You don't think that's extraordinary? Well, you... Um, yes or you no? Think, no, I, well, it's not the same as saying you have a dog, but I think the claim that someone took over the world when they were 30 years old is pretty extraordinary, too. Well... Okay, I realize that we're, we're two people separated by a common language, but I would think that when we talk about something that's extraordinary, uh, we, we could at least agree that claiming that somebody was a god and performed miracles that violate the physical laws of the universe is extraordinary, couldn't we? All right, I get your point, but you're deciding that it's not extraordinary evidence. What about prophecies? Isn't that extraordinary evidence that it was predicted before? No. Is it a, is I, I'm not I'm not aware um, of, of any sort of prophecy that could possibly serve to to prove the kind of thing that you're saying. Okay. Well, anyway, I just have one uh, question. If there's no God, where do you think we get universal morals from? Uh, I, I mean, if, if I say uh, uh, something horrible like torturing babies for your own personal enjoyment is immoral everywhere on the earth at every time. Where does that come from if, uh, if there's no God to give us that moral, um, universal moral uh, principle? Do you want to... Like, <laughs> you did a whole presentation on this. Yeah, I, I've run around giving an entire talk on this, but let me, let me try to answer this. Um, you're asserting that your, your, your exaggerated claim that you, you feel that anybody would consider is immoral. Um, torturing babies for your own pleasure is immoral at all places, at all times, etc. And the idea that this is universally considered immoral, you want to know where that comes from? If it doesn't come from God, where does it come from? It can't come from you because... Why not? People have different opinions about that. Y yes, but w the fact that we have different opinions about things doesn't mean that we aren't also the authors of what we consider to be right and wrong. The fact is we are similar creatures in similar circumstances. It's all about, morality is about the interaction of people and the fact that our, our actions have consequences and that those consequences don't just affect ourselves, that they affect other people as well and they affect the kind of society that we live in. And the, the idea that a society that, tor that allows, permits as a moral action the torture of children for one's pleasure would be a better society than one that prohibits it as something that's immoral is is absurd. Yeah, but you're just talking about practicality, like don't do it because sure. it's, it. uh, it's it's not simple consequentialism or it's not simple practicality. We're talking about real consequences. The type of the type of society that we live in would a society be generally better? Um, would the well-being of that society be generally better if we permitted as a moral good the torture of children? I, I, I think that that's absolutely absurd. You think that, you think that but other people might not. So. Sure, screw them. Yeah, Th they're okay. immoral. Well, yeah, well, you're saying that, but when I say it's immoral, I know it is because I get it from God. You really? Know, you can't do that. Really? So if your God changes his mind and tomorrow says that torturing little kids for your pleasure is moral, that makes it moral? That God doesn't say that. So that's How do you know? Uh, dashing little babies against the rocks? That's in the Bible. Yeah, in the Old Testament. Oh, oh so you oh. don't pay any attention to the Old Testament? Jesus came and he changed it. You guys don't know anything. You have to do your homework before you start to talk about the Bible. Okay, first of all, uh, n hello, fundamentalist Christian for 25 years, have lectured, was going to be a minister, have taught about the Bible. Um, if you want to talk about Bible knowledge, let's go. Because what you're, basically what you're adhering to is this, this idea that let's chug out the whole Old Testament 
um, because Jesus came and changed everything. So are you then saying that God was an immoral thug monster and then got better in the New Testament? No, he had, you should know this. He had to do that because that was the only way to ensure that the Messiah would come. But once the Messiah came, then it changed. Oh, so he had to be immoral in order to fix things later. That's why he needed to keep everything pure so that the Messiah would come. So it was for the greater good in the end. I, okay, can you, can you answer me this? Are you being for real? Because, I mean, you're starting to sound like a Poe. Are you honestly presenting this? As what, Listen, you, as what if, you sincerely believe, or are you just wasting my time? If they didn't believe, then Jesus wouldn't have come. And that would have been worse overall, because everyone would go to hell. <laughs> okay, then the God you believe in is still an immoral monster. Well, I know that it was, I know if, if you take away that context, then it would sound like a bad thing. No, there's but, no, there's no context. There is no context in which slavery becomes moral. There is no context in which killing little kids becomes moral. And by the way, you're arguing not for an objective moral standard that comes from God. You are arguing, in fact, for divine command, which means that you actually believe that it was morally right for God to command those things in the Old Testament because it was necessary. You've just made that argument. So your morality isn't objective, isn't derived from anything moral or true. It's just whatever God says. So when you claim that God can't say that, you can't make that claim because mate, for all you know, your God may have a good reason to make it moral to torture babies tomorrow. Do you know more than your God? Look, he did Look, that. Did, if, he didn't do, if he doesn't do that, everybody goes to hell and gets tortured forever. How is that wrong? So he doesn't do have power over that? Well, he, look, Adam is the one that decided to betray him, so that wasn't God's fault. It wasn't then, my fault God either. had to do that to bring Jesus. That wasn't God's fault either. What, what does God get to blame for if he's the all-knowing creator of everything? Well, Adam gets the blame because Adam betrayed him. Okay, I didn't. Yeah, but Adam represented you. I didn't, I didn't elect Adam as my representative. How is that moral for Adam to be my representative? Well, that is... How is it moral to punish the sins of the offspring for their parents? Is because, it moral just because your God says it's moral? Well, you said you were a Christian, so I know that you're being dishonest when you say, when you pretend like you don't know the answer, because you've obviously studied it. I, I, I know a lot of different answers. I'm asking you for your opinion, because to me, this is a contradictory position. What would you have said if I asked you back when you were a Christian? I, does it matter? I want to know. I, I can tell you, I would have given answers very much like yours. And then I woke up and realized how absolutely absurd those were, they were and how I was sitting around making excuses for immorality and disguising morality. Well, uh, if it's just making excuses, then that's your opinion, but oh, it's that's just, the way the Bible is, and you know it as well as I do. Uh, better, evidently. Anyway, I just want to leave off with one last thing, which is um, the very best proofs for God um, you haven't even discussed on your show, such as... Um, well, actually, the, since, um, we've discussed uh, the every, since we've discussed every proposed proof such for Such as God, Chris Langan. Oh, did you hang up? Good, because that saves me a whole lot of time. George, thanks for waiting. You yeah. there? I'm, I'm Christian. I want to do a shout out to other Christians to call in and correct the mistakes on the show because I think there's way too many atheists on the show. That's the first thing well, I want to say. It's an atheist show. Uh, yeah. You, yeah, but how can look, we have too many atheists on an atheist show? You're doing this in Texas, and I think there's a lot more Christians who should be calling in and defending. We agree. The holy the holy book, you know. <laughs> we, we absolutely uh, agree. So please, please con encourage all of your Christian friends to call the show. Yeah, we, we've got nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I just, I have two things I wanted to say. First thing is, I have a proof of God. Second thing, I have a proof that the Bible is true. Um, my, my proof, I'll start with my proof that the Bible is true. Um, the proof of the Bible is true is there's actually a prophecy in the Bible. Um, a, and it, it actually predicted the crucifixion of Jesus. It's Psalm 22, 1, and Psalm 22, 11 to 18. 
and uh, John 19, 23 to 24. That's the best prophecy in the whole Bible. And uh, what do you have to say about that? Um, <laughs> have, you, have you talked to Jews about this? Yeah. Because <laughs> they're not convinced. And, and we're talking about their ancient book and their prophecies about a Messiah. Um, and yet they don't accept this. They seem to have a different list of things that, that they consider prophetic than what Christians do. And um, they don't seem to think that Jesus fulfilled the prophecy and is the Messiah. I'm so, talking about I mean, the prophecy, that's the prophecy uh, that you know that Jesus would be uh, Jesus would be crucified. It said that in, in the verses that I told you about. Sure. Uh, so if I go and look up Psalms, what was it right away? It was Psalm twenty-two one, Psalm twenty-two eleven to eighteen, and John nineteen twenty-three twenty-four. That's the best prophecy in the whole Bible. Sure. So Psalm 22, 1 starts with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? That? Right, right. And then, and then what verse is after that in 22? 22, uh, 11 to 18. 11 through 18? Yes. It says, Do not be far from me, and trouble is near, and there is no one to help. My uh, Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of passion encircle me, roaring lions that tear their prey open. Their mouths wide against me, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax, it is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot's herd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death, dogs surround me, a uh, pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and feet, all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me, they divide my clothes amongst them and cast lots for my garment. You got it. What does that sound like to you? That sounds like the crucifixion. Um... <laughs> Sure, there are elements of that that sound a little bit like uh, the account of the crucifixion. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's right. Okay, yeah. let, let me uh, ask you something. It's not a prophecy. Yeah. Um, what do you mean? That's, that's almost, that's the like details of the crucifixion that happened like way after that was even written. No, no, no. A prophecy no. is a foretelling of something. It has to explicitly be, this is something that's going to happen in the future, and it will be fulfilled by a specific event that can't be duplicated. Well, what did you think that sounded like to you? It sounded like someone that wrote the New Testament knew about that psalm and, and wrote in the New Testament something that would make that appear to come true. Look, if you read John 19, 20 through 24, mm -hmm. you're going to see the exact same thing that happened many exactly. years after that was written. Exactly. Sure. And the author of John knew about that psalm. Do you, do you think they didn't know about these verses? They, we, we already know that the author who wrote the book that carries the name Matthew specifically went back through the Old Testament um, looking for any type of prophecy that he might be able to fulfill, which is why Matthew is such a padded uh, book that differs a lot from the other canonical gospel, gospels. Um, but in, in order for a prophecy to be anything that carries any weight, it needs to be specific. It needs to be fulfillable by only a single event. Um, it can't be something that's public, that people are actively trying to uh, fulfill. For example, if I tell the waiter that I want uh, a medium rare steak, and he brings me that steak, is he fulfilling prophecy? No. And if somebody is saying, you know, it, it also can't be something mundane. So what, what's happened here is we have a psalm written ages before about somebody lamenting um, and, and bemoaning their sorrow and their troubles. And we have similar things that are written into the account of the crucifixion. Now, they're not identical, uh, yeah, but, well, but they're, but they're, but they're to similar. The, to the one in John, he says, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, divided them into four shares. That's exactly like the psalm. It says, I, I people, understand uh, that. They, they divide my garments among them. Sure, I, I understand that. It's exactly the same. Uh, I, I, I understand what you're saying. What I'm saying is, why do you think that this is actually a prophecy, first of all, when it's not considered part of the Messianic prophecy by Jews? And why do you consider it prof prophetic fulfillment when the author who's giving you the account of what happened has clearly made this appear to be similar to this passage? That, do you think it was all backwards that he did, he wrote it on purpose? Yeah. Yeah. So they all plan to do it to do Jesus just like it said they would. Sure, I think that's song. very likely. I also think that there's a number of other things that are potentially likely, including coincidence. But my big thing is I can't confirm any of this happened in the first place. You're citing you're citing a, a story 
in an old book, and by the way, a story is told a number of different ways depending on which gospel you actually uh, read, but you're citing a story that I can't confirm. And even if it were true, even if this were a clear prophecy that clearly was fulfilled, it doesn't tell us anything at all about the source of this prophecy. I mean, the fact that somebody could make a prediction and it comes true is neat. But once you have determined, for example, that I've, ec, prediction X has been made and it has come true, how do you then determine why it came true? Did it come true by happenstance? Was it coincidence? Was it somebody actively working to do it? Was this um, somebody actually manipulating the facts in their account to match up with something? Or is there no known explanation? And if there's no known explanation, that doesn't mean you get to say that the reason that it's, that, that it's proof of God because it could be that there is no God, but this writer in Psalm was some kind of futuristic psychic who was able to see pictures of the future, but that doesn't tell you that the source of his pictures in his head were God. Well, what do you think it was? Uh, alien came I don't and think, told him? I, I, don't I don't think, think it, was it was a prediction, and I don't think yeah. it required any kind of foresight. All right, well, I, I, I won't take too much of your time. Are you I'll sure you're not Mark from Stone Church and Thomas and all the other names that you've used? Are you sure you won't talk about Chris Lankin because you're too scared? Oh, oh you yeah. are. I finally too, busted your faking ass. You're too scared to talk about it. Are you, are you really? Chris Lankin yourself? Because that'd be really cool. You know you're a tool, right? Thanks. Hey, hang up. <laughs> Thanks for wasting our time. I'm sure the chat room was probably going nuts saying, when's he going to yeah. call him out? When's he going to call him out?